Hey, everybody, this is Neil Pasricha, and welcome or welcome back to chapter 134 of Three Books. If you are new, if you are just joining us, this is our 22 year long pilgrimage to uncover and discuss the 1,000 most formative books in the world. We are ranging all over the place, talking to people like Quentin Tarantino, Brené Brown, David Sedaris, Debbie Millman, Roxane Gay, and today, Miss Susan Orlean. So, Susan Orlean, I got an email from longtime three-booker Bo Boswell who told me he found an enticingly titled thread on Reddit that was called, What's Your Field of Study, Hobbyist or Professional, and What's a Cornerstone Beginner cornerstone beginner's book for that topic slash field. Really interesting title. So Bo looked into it and the number one most upvoted, 164 time upvoted reply read thusly. Librarian here, Susan Orlean's The Library Book is at first glance a true crime book about tracking the arsonist who set fire and burned down the main library in Los Angeles. But it also gives a comprehensive glimpse into contemporary libraries and their issues, especially updating a view of them if you haven't been inside one since you were a kid. Well, Bo picked up the book, he loved it, and then he wrote me that the amount of research and bizarre detail that Susan Orlean puts into her work is so engrossing. Well, bizarre detail is something we love on three books. And so I was convinced, I picked it up, I read the library book, it totally blew me away. I mean, reading the book honestly felt like walking down a library. There was surprising curiosity trails at every turn. I ended up putting the book in my best of 2023 list. Every year I make a list of the top 20 books I read that year. So it's on the list for 2023. And then I went deeper into Susan's back catalog where I found myself reading profiles like The American Man, age 10, where she profiled a 10 year old American, which is really amazing. And a series of fascinating unconventional obituaries that she wrote about people like the inventor of Hawaiian Tropic or the first magician ever on the Las Vegas Strip. I have come to think of Susan Orlean as really one of the greatest nonfiction writers working in the world today, kind of bar none. She has been a staff writer for The New Yorker since 1992 and has written more than 10 best-selling books, including The Library Book, On Animals, Saturday Night, and The Orchid Thief, which you may have heard of. It got turned into that famous movie adaptation, which starred Meryl Streep in the Oscar-nominated role as, yes, Susan Orlean. Susan has an endless unbridled curiosity, that bizarre detail Bo was talking about, which you will see on full display in this conversation, which begins by us talking about how Susan organizes her shoes and then her spices. She is a real writer's writer who offers us a true masterclass and always reminds us that storytelling and knowledge sharing is, in her words, the essential human experience. This is a very human experience powerful conversation. I'm so excited to share it. I hope you find it endlessly inspiring, thoughtful, and resonant like I did. Let's jump into chapter 134 now. Ah, well, Susan, it is so, so, so nice of you to do this. I feel so excited and I've been looking forward to this for a very, very long time since the email um, connecting us from Michael Harris, uh, the dear Michael Harris. Yes. Um, and you are known for your powers of observation and perception. Uh, and you're also known for never carrying a tape recorder with you. So I wondered if you might kick us off today by simply describing this scene. Uh, the scene we're in right this very minute. Um, well, I am sitting in my glass box of a studio, which is out on the courtyard of my house in Los Angeles. It looks like I'm in Hawaii, I think, because I'm out in the yard surrounded by greenery. My uh, dogs are clawing at the door to come out and make noise, and I've begged my husband to keep them inside. So for the moment, it's very quiet. So you're inside or outside? Uh, I'm in, I have a standalone um, studio that is on the courtyard. Out, it's a little building on the courtyard of my house. So my house is 
um, I don't know, I'm terrible at distances, but I could, you know, hop on one foot for 10 ah. seconds and get to my house. Raw doll esque. My own, my own private space that um, I work in and try to keep very much uh, sealed off from my family and distraction. So we've got your glass box, Hawaiian esque, with dogs potentially clawing and scratching at the door. And that's fine if there's noise. That's, we like all sound. So it sounds like you've described half of the scene. Oh, and now I have to describe you. So I'm looking at the, uh, the modern, in, in the modern world, I'm looking in the portal of reality. And um, through my portal, I see you. I see very, um, it looks like you're in a study of some sort, because I see a lot of boxes. And an interesting pop art um, painting behind you. And uh, otherwise, a fairly spare room. It looks like, um, I'm guessing it's your uh, recording studio slash workspace. Yes, yes. And, of course, your very famous first line when describing John LaRoche in The Orchid Thief is, John LaRoche is a tall guy, skinny as a stick, pale-eyed, slouch-shouldered, and sharply handsome, in spite of the fact that he's missing all his front teeth. Ah, well. Uh, how about if we just say it applies perfectly to you? <laughs> We can just reuse that. <laughs> we'll just re recycle it, Neil. We don't need to even edit it. I can't tell how tall you are, though. That's the only thing. Five foot um, nine, 164 pounds. <laughs> well, you know, oh, there you, there you go. All right. Fair enough. Well, you're wearing a very cool pink blazer that I'm lusting after. Um, and I would say, and you know, the funny thing about communicating with someone um, by email as we have, this is the first time we're meeting. So I had no idea of what you look like, none. Um, so there's the freshness of meeting a person and having them fit or not fit your expectation. Though as a writer, um, I think it's really good to be surprised because that's mm. how you notice things. Ooh, it's really good to be surprised. Yes, yes, yes. Our relationship with surprise has diminished substantially over the last few decades, I would think. Well, sure. I mean, think about, <coughs> pardon me, um, I was discussing this with my son recently. He's 19. And he had asked, um, we were talking about dating. And I said, you know, you may find it hard to believe, but I was dating people in an era before you could Google someone and see what they look like and look at their social media and, oh, good for you. Um, and, and be completely, you know, you have an experience of the person before you actually have an experience of them. Oh, said, interesting. You have you an know, experience of the person before you have an experience of them. If I said that right. Yeah, them. because yeah. if you, you do all of this preparation, you look up the person, you read all about them, you see lots of images of them, you aren't meeting them freshly. You, you can't. Um, no, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying that the difference is you don't enter an encounter with people these days with that kind of shock of the new. 
unless you purposely don't Google your podcast host to right. preserve and maximize the visual start where I see your beautiful sweater as you pull your hand through your incredibly, um, you know, uh, dark orange locks curling over your navy blue and white ribboned shoulder in front of the reflective glass. Hawaiian is a great phrase. I was thinking Jurassic Park, like, like yeah, tall, big plants. You know, they're not, these aren't your little corner house plants. These are people, these are like going to the top of the screen if you're not watching this on YouTube. And Cube Works, by the way, Susan, is a local business in Toronto where my friend Michael Minoska hand makes to your spec and design your own Rubik's Cube art. Oh, brilliant. So, so mine is 260 cubes spelling out the word wow. He wanted to do awesome. I refused. And I just wanted something to give me some physical and mental pop before I do an interview or a speech or something, you know? Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, and so now you've entered into this, I don't know if we want to call it an envelope, a little um, uh, bubble together, which is a chapter of three books. And so this is a very highly organized podcast. I use the word organized with you purposely and with bold because we're going to connect over that right now. So for those that are new to the show, watching or listening for the first time, three books was started on March 31st, 2018, and it finishes very specifically on April 26, 2040. Not just those particular two dates, but the specific time on those dates when the full moon is its most full. Um, as people may or may not know, full moons are actually only full for one minute. They're not full the minute before or the minute after. I didn't know that. Because they're, they're, a, they're a waxing gibbous or they're oh. a waning gibbous right before or after that they're totally perfectly full. And so um, we just thought that the lunar, we thought the Gregorian calendar was so, it's so like contemporary, you know, it's like. 500 years named after a pope. I mean, let's go with something we've been using, you know, uh, you know, woolly mammoth bones on checking out for 30,000 years, the lunar calendar people. <laughs> and so books are that. They are that to me. They're that to you, I know, in terms of their, 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 their way to annex and communicate with history. And so on the exact minute of every single full moon for 333 straight lunar cycles, we're going to talk with an inspiring person such is the one and only Susan Orlean, author of The Orchid Thief, author of the library book, um, basis for Meryl Streep's uh, Oscar-nominated performance in the movie adaptation, New Yorker staff writer since 1992, and having written for them well before that. And I'm going to go on and on. I'm just gushing because I'm so, so in love with your work. Um, and on the exact minute of every single full moon, we drop a conversation. We call it a chapter. We have 333 chapters. Each chapter discusses three formative books for a thousand formative books total over those 22 years. Speaking of organization, I have a few questions for you, but let's start with Susan. How do you organize your shoes? Oh, gosh, you've got me in, uh, I mean, I'm a little compulsive about organization. Um, I'm, and I feel honestly that I function better in an orderly environment. So it's actually really hard for me to work or be happy in chaos. Ooh. Um, I, I just, it doesn't have to be um, sterile or absolutely minimal. It just needs to be orderly. So shoes, we do not, we live in a mid-century modern house that um, back in 1946 when the house was built, um, closets were not a great kind of focus in home building and closets of older houses are generally very small. I think people just, you know, didn't have a lot of clothes. Um, so I have to be really careful about my shoes and have them organized so that I can find them and see them. And so 
some years ago, and I don't remember when, I realized that it would be better for me to take shoes out of the shoe box and put them in a clear shoe box so that I could see the shoes. And that worked From, from the well, container store, right? From the container store. Mm -hmm. and for those that, that want to buy one. Yes. And they you buy them, you know, in a box of like 20. Though they're great for organizing a lot of stuff, but they're meant for shoes. And then it started to become harder for me to see the shoes. So I came up with an idea that makes me sound super OCD. Um, I'm not, but I will own the fact that this is more effort than some people might choose to make. But I started taking a picture of each pair of shoes, printing, printing out the picture in a small um, format, and then taping that to the front of the shoe box so that in I in color, obviously. Oh yeah, so I could see instantly which the shoes were. Just front, just front view or side view or just, both? Uh, or? Just front view, and view, okay. um, I have the boxes stacked with the short end visible, so it's just a small picture. But it's the most effective thing I've probably ever done in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it really, it took something that was sort of ungovernable and challenging and frustrating on a daily basis because I would try to find shoes and think, wait, where, where are those green sneakers? And, you know, I'd be pawing through a pile of shoes or opening different shoe boxes. And now I am in a kind of Zen space when I go in to pick a pair of shoes. I just so, walk in and look and I see the ones I want and I pull them out and I take the shoes out and I'm very happy. Nice. I love this. I've been telling I been a librarian, look, I mean, this is all, you know, we, I mean, humanity is into, um, taxonomy. I mean, it's just, it's a human impulse to, find and categorize and index and organize. And, and there's a real reason for it, obviously, scientifically. But I think people respond also to knowing where things are and how to find them and making things like with like in terms of you know, organizing, and I'm not somebody who, you know, alphabetizes the books on my shelf, or I did alphabetize my spices, I will confess. Well, that's actually a really nice segue, because my next question, and I'm, before we get into your three books, you can see I've got a few, um, you know, uh, amuse-bouches for you, and one of them is, how do you, I was going to go into how do you organize your kitchen right after the shoes, so why don't we, we could just focus on spices and then I was going to ask you how you organize your books on your bookshelf, which I know they're not alphabetical, but now that leaves open a lot of other things. Right. Uh, well, I began, you know, I, ha I love to cook and I have a fair number of spices, not, not an enormous number, but every time I would try to find, say, the oregano, I would literally have to look through every single jar of spices at, to find the oregano. And very often I would think, well, I guess I don't have oregano. And I'd go buy it, bring it home, and then, of course, immediately find the oregano <laughs> that had been, you know, mysteriously misplaced. And it just was so maddening because I had a very good spice cabinet but they were completely out of order. And it just dawned on me one day that it would be a lot easier if they were alphabetical, not by first letter, not. Ooh, interesting, not by first letter. Oh, I'm fascinated no, by, now. only by the first letter. Like I don't, oh, okay. within the C's, I don't 
think, let me see, cardamom comes before cloves. I, oh. it's <laughs> the seed. So I'm not. Just all the seeds. Really, You're not. I'm let's. Not, <laughs> drilling down into the second letter. It's just by letter. The G's are all together. The C's are all together. And it really, it spared me this annoying habit of not being able to find the spice that I want and buying it again and then thinking, how did I end up with five jars of cardamom? Like, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Not good. Right, right. This would have really helped me on Sunday when I was making chili and I couldn't find chili powder, heaven forbid. And so eventually, as you have intimated, it was at the back in a totally incorrect location. But I have a couple questions here. Number one, um, like, when I go out and rebuy spices, like some of them are in bags, some of them are bulk size, some of them are in this one tiny little organic container that I have seven glass ones, and that's how the set started, but it doesn't continue that way. And so the alphabetizing sounds great in theory, but for me, if I was gonna go upstairs and do it, what do you do with the rubber band saran wrap bags? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, how does this all uh, well, work together? Again, this is makes me sound, I'm embarrassed to say, this does make me sound, more OCD than I really am, but I, the jars that are square, I keep. Anything that's not in a square jar, I transfer, I just bought a bunch of empty square, um, square edged spice jars and I transfer stuff into them so that they can all fit. I like this. I like this. This is really, really smart. That's the yeah. piece I'm missing. That's the piece of the puzzle I hadn't figured out yet. To bu the buying yeah. of mass quantity square edged glass spice jars. Right. And, you, you know, they cost uh, maybe $20 on Amazon to get 40 I mean, they're very <laughs> cheap. But I also had the discovery some years ago that round canisters and round containers waste a bunch of space. And so, yes. you know, if you have a limited amount of space, as most of us do, yes. you know, a finite amount of space, yes. you want to make use of all of it. So I yes. had all of these round canisters yes. and containers, and I swapped them all out for um, square-edged ones to make better use of the space. Because... You know, my pantry isn't huge. My spice rack is very nice, but yeah. limited. In, in, yeah. Um, and you just can fit a lot more in. You um, know, I, I totally hear you. And, you know, you are famous for the, like, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles you've written for The New Yorker since 1987. Of course, you were a staff writer there since... Um, 1992, and one of your most famous columns is called Afterward, which is sort of a, what I would describe to my wife upstairs at lunch today was like sort of an unconventional obituaries type of type of thing. And so as you may or may not know, and you could keep track of it if you're interested, somebody at Fiji Water had the exact same insight, which is why they changed all those round water bottles at Fiji to squares so they could ship them from Fiji, where they're, where they're bottled, the actual country Fiji, over to sell them to us for seventeen dollars each in the airport. Ah, that's so interesting, and it also is um, makes you understand the uh, phenomenon of container ships and containers. <laughs> yes, um, yes, yes. I mean, we container ships are the standard of global shipping and you know they're very familiar to all of us we have a wooden one right outside my studio right now for my kids yeah well believe like it or not like a wooden not, container ship yeah believe it or not <laughs> one day someone brilliant who is now a multi-billionaire of course um came up with the idea that you could ship a lot more stuff if you put it in a uniform container that could be stacked versus a barrel, a box, a bag, you know, where you have random items sort of jostling together on a boat. And there's a lot of 
empty, wasted space. But if you, um, if you uh, kind of standardize the way you package items that are being shipped, you know, you look at these container ships and they are carrying hundreds yeah. of these massive containers and they can be secured together. And, you know, it became almost immediately that after it was sort of conceived, became the standard of global shipping. That's all. That's the only way things are sent around the world. Right. And, you know, there's some, there's very few kind of like universal humanity ahas in life. One of them, yeah. of course, being the identification of that little arrow on your gas gauge that tells you which side your gas right. pump is on. But another aha that I've noticed many people have, including myself, I'm now seeing it in my kids, is the, the, common universal humanity aha that is the container ship containers are the same as the things being pulled down the train tracks right and that's <laughs> exactly why and they're also the exact same things that are on the back of flatbed trucks oh yeah i forgot yeah. i honestly forgot that they pull up to the port and they get loaded onto the truck and the truck drives off i mean they you know it really was a brilliant um, concept that fits in a world in which an item that you buy from China might travel both by sea, by train, and by truck, but it never has to be unpacked. It's, yeah. It just moves in this container from one mode of transportation to the other, and there's a good chance that we will never iterate further on this. It's like it's such a, it works so well. Yeah. Um, that, and, you know, that's the way things get around the world is yeah. on multiple different forms of transportation. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. Do you cool. think it's just, do you think it's just capitalism itself as a concept that helps further and create such clean, crisp, global uniformity on things like container ships, but doesn't for like things like controlling pollution or, you know, is, is that the, the, the sort of magnet that, that creates us being able to do things like that globally, but like things like uh, the ice cubes on the top and bottom of Earth are melting and we're not going to have New York soon, that we can't figure out. Right. Oh, uh, you know, sadly, yes. I think <laughs> um, profit and commerce are incentives that um, really push forward enterprise and innovation and motivation. Um, you know, I, if you look at global warming there will be pe people who will lose a lot of money because of it. And I mean, it is ultimately a world ruin wrecker, but in the short term, nobody um, feels incentivized to solve the problem. It's it, right now it's mostly a negative thing that, companies have to figure out how to create less pollution or people have to figure out how to drive less often. I mean, it's, it feels like all sacrifice. Whereas when there's a tangible. Yeah. Short profit, term. Mm -hmm. Short term. Mm -hmm. um, you get a lot of smart people thinking, how can this, how can we figure this out? And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a sobering fact about human nature. So the solution is, if we can have somebody make money off of figuring out how to fix the electoral college system, it would be solved soon, as opposed to the Iowa caucuses, as we talk, having a hugely disproportionate effect on the future of the world. A hundred percent. I mean, it. yeah, I I think... Human beings are wired to be 
selfish. I mean, that's the survival instinct. And then when you amplify that, it's, I want more. Not only do I want to survive, I want more of the good stuff that's out there. And, uh, you know, we've, we've certainly made tremendous improvements in life since, say, the 1500s. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot, of, a lot of those improvements have had... Um, somebody is also making money. I, my husband and I were just talking the other day about AIDS, and we were watching um, television, and there was a commercial for a uh, an AIDS drug that allows it's one pill a day and it keeps you in a maintenance mode with no de detectable HIV in your bloodstream and you know I lived through the AIDS crisis I lost friends you know oh, it wow. was something that was a terrifying, um, overwhelming circumstance. And really, when you look at it, within a pretty remarkably short amount of time, we've managed to figure yeah. out yeah. how to treat it. I mean, this is a very complex yeah. disease. It's, you know, it killed millions of people right and you figured out how to give many many people with hiv a perfect life that is sustainable as far as we know yeah. for a normal lifespan and i just wow. we were marveling over it and then i thought well you know pharmaceutical companies do have a profit motive. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, certainly the um, NIH was involved. I mean, it was a, a global effort to figure out how to treat AIDS. But at the end of the day, it is a very um, commercial thing to cure a disease. Oh, People interesting. Make money. What, a, what a fascinating observation. It is a very commercial thing to cure a disease. Obviously, when you hear it, yeah, but you don't think of it that way. You know, the largest company in Denmark, which is now responsible for an enormous percentage of the GDP, oh. is Novo Nordisk, which makes Ozempic. So, and yeah, insulin, right? Drugs are yeah. very profitable invention. And <laughs> yeah, we benefit from the drugs that are developed that cure disease. But we don't live in a society where that's done for the public good and nobody makes money off of it. I mean, drug companies are public or rather private for profit enterprises. Right, <laughs> right, there's right. A ton of innovation. Cash Casting the play and fun of Lego aside, um, being another Denmark company, I think. Um, yes, well, <laughs> that, and that's another, right. Right. So, um, like, play, you know, play can be profitable too, but, you know, uh, not nearly right. as profitable as, as, as putting stuff in pills. Well, Susan, you've been very kind to let me tease out a little bit of my curiosity around you with the um, – you know, letting us into the, the sort of palate cleanser, yet letting you describe the scene and then getting into the sort of organization kind of geek out, I'd, you know, uh, that we both share, the structure of the show, the structure of your shoes, your spice, your spice jar. I'm going to save the bookshelf and book organization for a little later. It's going to come for those listening that want to know how Susan organizes her books. I'm not going to miss it. I promise yeah. me. But the other palate cleanser I often do on this show is when I'm interviewing a guest who has said or written a lot of things about books, writing, or reading, I comb through a treasure trove of their quotes written or, or spoken, and I find three or four of the best ones. Unfortunately, with you, my favorite books, book 
writing or reading quotes are, are, are two pages. I have just two pages before I, just on your, my favorite, not even yours, just my favorite of yours on books, writing or reading. And I don't know how to get three out of this. So let me try for each quote I read to you. I would love you to expand, explain, or elucidate as you see fit. Or you could simply say, you know, rim shot, next one. You know, like if, you, if it's just, if it says it, great. <sighs> First off, hats off to Melville Dewey. We owe him a lot. He's a hero. You said that on the Sleeping with Celebrities podcast. Uh, well, this goes back to what we were just talking about. Um, this human impulse to organize and categorize um, probably is most explicitly shown when we think about books and knowledge and information. And the Dewey Decimal System, um, you know, the idea of organizing the mental output of histories, you know, the writers throughout history and to have come up with a system that, while it's not perfect, it's withstood the test of time, but also to begin to allow us to impose some kind of order on books is pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a fun, it's funny. It's such a funny, um, feels like such an old fashioned arcane system, but we haven't, ever improved on it every single library still organized today and if you were at my house right now i would take you upstairs to my i'm lucky to say a room where i have floor to ceiling bookshelves and all my books are organized in the dewey decimal system really wow yeah, except for my mass market paperbacks because i was very lucky to find recently in my house a whole big metal pillar that i didn't know existed that Seven, uh, six sevenths of a mass market paperback can sit. So as long as nobody touches my shelf, then I, I have made new room for books, which is what I've, wow. which I'm, yeah. So I, all my mass market paperbacks are on one separate shelf. Um, and the 2019 Book Riot review of your Arlington Public Library press stop for the library book, they quote you as saying, when it comes to, and I'm holding it up in case you're watching on YouTube, um, that when it comes to your remarkable, heart-rending book, the library book, you wrote, or you said, I didn't want a dust jacket. I didn't want anything between you and the book. Uh, it, you know, this is in, in reference to the design of the library book. And... When you're writing a book about books, uh, the design and the physical object that of the book is extremely important. Um, it because it it really is the physical manifestation of what the book is all about. So I always had in my mind that it would be only text on the cover. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. Only uh, text on the cover. That's a surprising decision. Right. I mean, if you go back to the front cover, um, you know, we have this little symbol of the fire in the very center. But otherwise, I just wanted it to be the name of the book. So Why? it's very much the book as a book. Ah, ah <laughs> okay. No, yeah, no interference. Exactly. No thing standing in the place of the book except a small flame icon. <coughs> exactly. And, and on the spine, which I'm holding up now carefully in my camera, would, yeah. would you? Well, so what we have on the spine, and, and, you know, I think it's so beautiful, and the design all hats off to Simon & Schuster for really making this an exquisite book. We've got those two palm fronds, which is a, you know, a very subtle reference to the fact that this takes place in L.A. Mm -hmm. And then if you look, if you turn to the spine again, um, that little, uh, what looks like a little building is a, 
a, a sort of um, graphic version of the tower of the L.A. Public Library. Wow, now, I had no idea. Until you read the book, you wouldn't know. And yeah. You wouldn't even necessarily. No, I read the book. I still didn't know. <laughs> no, I mean, it, actually, I didn't. I shouldn't have even put it that way. It's, it is a obviously meant to look like a little building or a little tower of a building. It happens to be based on the tower of the LA library, but it doesn't matter that you know that or you don't know it. Right. Um, like the palm fronds. Exactly. And so, there's also some bird, like silhouette of birds as well. Right. Right. So we've got, you know, the sky. Which are not, which the, are, why, why birds, by the way? I'm a, uh, I'm a big birder. Just um, almost as if you were looking at the library tower from outside and you oh, see, the wow. and see the birds in the sky. Wow. It's a wonderfully subtle. Wow. Um, and it just reads as being beautiful, whether you take apart the meaning of each of those symbols. It, it's um, the effect of it is still just being beautiful. Well, I also, in that same 19, 2019 Book Riot review of your Arlington Press Tour for the library book, came across the Easter egg that you hid in the back flap of the book, which, of course, is the mock uh, library checkout card in a, in a yellowed envelope with four names on it reading Ray Bradbury... And this, you know, the, the everybody who's listening will be familiar with the sort of librarian's sort of off-centered date stamp, uh, crossed out August twenty fourth, nineteen fifty. Then Edith Gross, uh, uh, October thirty first, nineteen fifty five. Then Susan Orlean in a blue cursive writing. Not sure if that's your real signature, on uh, April twenty ninth, nineteen eighty six. And then Austin Gillespie, September tenth, two thousand ten. And there is. Uh, much discussion on Reddit online about what the non-obvious two names mean, Edith Gross and Austin Gillespie, and no conclusive proof, although the top commenter in this Reddit thread I went deep on says that they suspect Edith Gross is your mom and Austin Gillespie is your son. Yes, that is actually correct. And we have it on the record for the first time. Yes. Um... <laughs> And partly is that his birth why, date? Is that his birth date? The date? No, that's the date that he I said he's 19. was. Um, that I believe that. I mean, it was as close as I could guess to being the date that I took him to the library, and for the first time thought, "I have to, I have to write this book." Uh, right, because he's 20, 19 now, and it's September 10, 2010. So I guess he would have been five or six. Right, because he had an assignment from his little school class to interview mm. a public servant, and he wanted to interview a librarian. And why, why April 29th, 1986, beside your name? The date of the fire. Oh, of course. And, of course, I read the book and neglected to right, capture that. It's, you know, it's, and, and, and can I ask, just because I'm now I'm in, I'm in nerd world here, Edith Gross has October 31st, 1955. That's, that's my your, birthday. That's your so, birthday. Yeah. So, oh, for your mom. Yeah. Oh, you're born on Halloween. I am. My sister-in-law, too. Um, and then birthday. Ray Bradbury, August 24th, 1950. Uh, that was um, a date at which he w was working on Fahrenheit 451. Oh. Um, and that we we were sort of, you know, trying to pick a random date when we thought he might have been in the library um, and when he was in the course of working on the book. Wow, wow, wow. A couple more I have, I can't resist. In Senegal, this is from the opening of the library book, but also I noticed you used the same phrase in your wonderful foreword for the Nancy Pearl um, book. And Nancy Pearl's been a past guest on, on our show oh, as well. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, uh, for the writer's library. And so, um, and the quote is this. Um, in Senegal, the polite expression for saying someone died is to say his or her library has burned. This um, was an expression that I came across, you know, completely 
uh, serendipitously. I don't even remember where I first saw it. The minute I saw it, I thought, wow, oh, that's so interesting. I don't quite understand it. Uh, I didn't yet see how you would equate a library to a person, but I liked it. I thought it sounded interesting, so I wrote it out on an index card, hung it over my desk, and I would look at it a lot while I was working on the book. At some point in the middle of working on the book, it all clicked, and it actually became thematically the entire meaning of the book, the, the closeness between our human soul, as it were, and a library, and how, while the connection may not seem that obvious, um, the way in which a library contain, contains dreams and knowledge mm. and facts and history mm. and memory and mm. really the whole of human experience mm -hmm. is much the way a person contains dreams wow. and memories and knowledge and fantasy and you know we we contain our own personal library of of thoughts and and i think that um many of us have had this experience of trying to remember something and you almost feel like you're flipping through a card catalog no, no, not that, that, that's what I'm trying to remember. Yeah, like trying to find a word or and I, the name of the guy I, that played so-and-so. Exactly, remembering mm -hmm. the name of a place. And I, I began feeling like we have such an emotional connection to libraries because on some level they're, they're a sort of manifestation of the way our own minds feel. Ooh. And they are, for a community, um, the collective mind of a community. Wow. Hence us and when creating someone them, dies, potentially. what goes with them is that their entire library of stories and memories. And the, the parallels became more and more um, emotional to me that, you know, and I, I've often said to people, if City Hall had burned down, I don't think you would have had people crying and um, lining up to help in some way. But when the library burned, people were literally sobbing and 2,000 people gathered at the library as it was on fire saying, what can we do? How can we help? People take the burning of a library as a, an emotional blow. And that's why, as I said in the book, um, throughout the history of war, libraries have been burned, even though it's not particularly useful as a strategy in war but it's a psychological and emotional devastation for a society to have a library burn. People, people feel devastated by it yeah. in a way that's very special. And, uh, you know, we, we just have a different connection to books than we do to many other objects. Yeah. Um, they just yeah. have an emotional and sort of spiritual meaning to us that is unique, um, I think, in the entire sort of span of the things that are around us, um, books have a very distinct place that goes deep. Why? Why, why more so than anything else? Well, um, my feeling is that storytelling and knowledge sharing is the essential human experience. Books are just the, um, the, 
the means by which we do it. And, but, uh, you know, it, it has, it's how we um, exist together. We tell each other stories. We share knowledge. We... But then, uh, would people get as just as upset if they lost their DVD collection or they, you know, their record collection? Uh, or well, their I that cannot if, film, yeah, so cannot cool. film to, to the young Austin and my little tiny boys be the, a replacement for books in this world where people are arguably well, reading. I less? don't actually see it as. Um, one or the other. I, I mean, I think film is just another medium for storytelling. Mm -hmm. I do think books have an immediacy that, you know, a film is a, is a whole big production and there are hundreds of people involved and it's a laborious process and it's mediated so much by the fact that it's hard to make a movie. A book is almost like a whisper. In a way there's a simplicity. I've written my book and I'm telling you my story mm -hmm. and it feels more intimate because in fact it really is. Yes. Uh, you know, it takes yes. one person to write a book and then yeah, You've got an editor, and you've got the guys working the printing press. But it still really is as close to the really essential, simple experience of telling someone a story. Yes, yes, yes. So, and it's, I mean, it's, I and it's mind to mind. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, and as opposed to mind to eyes to mind. Exactly. Y you and know? I think that um, it exi books exist more in your imagination because you're not getting the visual. Exactly. This is partly why so I love uh, reading music reviews or like food. I like food descriptive stuff because it's like I, I it's neutering some of my senses by definition. Um, yeah. Well, this has been a wonderful, uh, I don't want to say a rant. What, what, what's the positive word for rant? Rant. <laughs> rant can be positive. Good. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, you've helpfully annexed a number of quotes I had right into that beautiful answer, including, and I'll just read them quickly because I, I want to, but then I, I still have two left, including destroying a culture's books is sentencing it to something worse than death, colon. It is sentencing it to seem as if it never lived. That's from the library book. Also from the library book. Writing a book, just like building a library, is an act of sheer defiance. It is a declaration that you believe in the persistence of memory. Also from the library book, books are a sort of cultural DNA, the code for who as a society we are and what we know, all the wonders and failures, all the champions and villains, all the legends and ideas and revelations of a culture last forever in its books. Then the two I still need some um, expansion, explanation or elucidation on are the last two are second last. The reading of the book was a journey. There was no need for souvenirs. Uh, this is in reference to my parents who were big readers, but were not book, um, they liked taking books out of the library and they didn't feel the need to own lots of books. Part of it was thriftiness and, um, feeling like, well, why buy it when you can take it out of the library. And I think because they felt like, well, the point is to read the book, not to own the book. And you don't need it on a shelf what, as like a token of having read it. You, you read it. You know, they, mm. didn't, they didn't really feel that that was a part of the experience. Um, now you remove the 
rereading of a book or making your notes in the book that some people love to do. The lending. For them, it was just about you read the book. And yeah, uh, you, know, if, I... you don't need to own it. Um, yeah. Now, I, the minute I could buy my own books, I started buying them like crazy. But I now do feel sometimes where I'll look at a book and think I read it, I enjoyed it. I don't know exactly why I need to keep it since I've already read it and yeah. chances are I'll never read it again. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, um, to, your, to your finite space comment earlier, I keep only two kinds of books on my bookshelves, which are one, books I've never read, like I want to read, to be read, or the anti-library anti phenomenon that Nassim Taleb coined in his book, Anti-Fragile, to have books to remind you of what you do not know. So, I, I, you know, there's the not read books. And then the only other kind of book I have on my bookshelf, Susan, is books I've loved. Right. So that's the Marie Kondo, you know, idea of if it falls in between, it falls away. And that's partly space-oriented. Right. Well, and I I sort of feel the same way, and I've begun feeling more like I have books that were written by friends, and I, you know, I keep them because they're special to me, and books I haven't yet read that I intend to read, and I've gotten more comfortable looking at a book and saying I read it, it didn't, I'm glad I read it, I don't need to keep it. You know, and, and this is partly because we do have bookshelf space, but it's not unlimited. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have, mm -hmm. uh, we're pretty tight and we've gotten so that all our bookshelves are completely full. So if we get a new book, we kind of have to get rid of another book. Mm -hmm. We all hit um, that pole eventually until we buy another house or something. <laughs> but it's exactly. interesting, you know, um, Seth Godin in chapter three refer refers to books as souvenirs of ideas. That's how he describes the concept of books themselves. Mm. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, who was our guest in chapter 37, when I first said, and I, I interviewed him in his place in Chelsea, and we were in a room you know, 10 feet by 10 feet and all four walls of the room. So we were sitting in a table in the center, all four walls of this room. So kind of the same size of the room as I'm in were floor to ceiling bookshelves of hardcovers. And I said to him, wow, I, you know, I feel like I'm entombed in your book. And he looked at me and he said, this is a fraction of my books, I should say. And I said, um, well, what do you mean? He said, I have another place. I keep another spot. And yeah. That idea is so close to me because I'm there, like I'm ready to build more book space. And because I've become really good friends with Doug Miller, who runs a used bookshop called Doug Miller Books. He refers to himself as a bibliomaniac. He has 300 to 500,000 books. He, he oh has rented the aforementioned um, uh, container. the containers he has three containers rented full of books in his bookshop which is i encourage you to go if you're ever in koreatown in toronto is a mere one percent of what's in the containers wow and so i don't want to go that far but in the way he's also inspiring <laughs> yeah yeah although i think that i've um embraced a certain marie kondo attitude I mean, partly because we have a finite amount of space. Yeah. And um, it's very funny. My mother-in-law is a book. And a lot of it's hoarder. shoes. Uh, a lot of it is shoes. Um, my mother-in-law is a book hoarder and has books, you know, piled everywhere. And there's a way in which they just become objects. Like, you can't even mm. act get to them and mm -hmm. I think if I had books off site <laughs> I would feel like what's the point of having them right like, right right them. it's like the china in the cabinet yeah and you know it's a um Swedish death cleaning kind of <laughs> thing too of thinking oh my god I like if this is a book that I'm done with yeah. I mean, some of it is feeling like someone else can enjoy it now. Yeah, Maybe and you don't want Austin to have to deal with it in 32 it. years. 
Yeah, so um, I I used to be much more into acquiring books. Mm -hmm. Now I'm, I just, I, I think about it more deliberately. Yeah. And also interestingly, for the last year or so, I've been mostly reading um, audiobooks. Oh, wow. Mostly listening to books. Wow. So those take up no space. Yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> because I'm just yeah. doing them online. Right. And in a way, it's very liberating. But yeah. But you lose the experience of flipping back. And yeah. I what, mean, it's, it's what very... What percent of your audiobooks do you purchase in, in physical form afterwards, if any? Um, I do... Do that sometimes. Like, and if what's your decision book, matrix to uh, making that decision? If there's a book that I just love, um, I and this is the same with ebooks. If it's a book that I really love, I'll go buy it in the physical form um, so that I can look at it again in a different. And also, it is different to read a book versus an ebook or an audio. Yeah. Definitely different. And are you hardcover, paperback? Uh, well, it depends. What's like, if available. you go back and buy the book you love, when what what which version of it are you buying? If you have uh, every version it really available, depend, it really depends on what's available. I mm -hmm. mean, if I'm mm -hmm. um, if a hardcover, I mean, I love hardcover books. So if a hardcover is available, that's usually what I'll buy because yeah. these are books I'm buying because they really resonated for yeah. me and and they are then just something i want as a as a trophy of something that i really loved yeah um on your surprising reveal of the audiobook transition that susan orlean is undergoing in her uh beautiful seventh decade of life that's inspiring for all of us i want to just insert one tiny funny phrase given to us by our guest in chapter 18 david sedaris who said if people who love books are bookworms then i love books on tape so i guess i'm a tapeworm that's really funny. Well, you know, I love, I am loving books on tape or whatever you would call them because I'm consuming a l many more books. Yeah. It I just amplifies could. your consumption. Oh, it's like, by, it's like a fat guy loves whipped cream, you know, like you get way more, you can fit a lot more down there than if right. you just have a piece of pie. <laughs> I mean, well, exactly. Um, now I'm reading probably three or four times as many books because right, right. because I have time in the day. I'm driving to do mm -hmm. errands. I'm mm -hmm. driving across town. I mean, it's mostly when I'm in the car. And that's all time now that I can use to read a book. It's Right. It's I mean, wonderful. this is why David does it. He picks garbage for nine hours a day, as is well known. And he has the picker, you know, the, the, the thing that stabs the garbage. He has the garbage bag and he has the thing in his ear so yeah. it, you know or on a flight or right. uh, i mean right. it's right. i really have loved it um i used to read a lot at night before i'd go to bed and i would be just so tired that i would read two pages and fall asleep right so exactly now well, you know, i'm <laughs> able to listen to books while i'm alert and awake which is a big plus and, and this is an unpaid mention, but I'll just say for anyone listening who's similarly, similarly inspired as I am, I love that Susan calls it, and you refer to it, Susan, as reading books, because it is, absolutely. That is the act of concentration. People often say, they demure, they say, oh, I wasn't really reading, I just listened to it on tape. No, no, that, that, that's reading a book. But I just want to enter a little plug again, it's unpaid, and I have no affiliation with them officially, but I personally highly recommend everybody check out Libro FM. L I B R O dot F M. It was introduced to us on three books in chapter 107 when I went down to the Bronx and hung out with Latanya and Jerry on the Bronx bound book bucks. As people know, the only bookstore in all of the Bronx which has the same population as Manhattan, but 81 less bookstores. 
And um, the reason is because when you sign up for Libra FM, it costs the same as Audible, but when you, instead of the money going to Jeff Bezos' $110 million yacht, you choose your local indie bookstore or whichever indie bookstore you like, and they get the profit margin. So it's just yeah. a really small way to just continue to support your local indie while you're also in, in audiobooks yeah. without funneling it to the 90% monopolist. Right. I think that's really great because, you know, audiobooks are you generally are paying top dollar um, and I buy them rather than having a subscription with Audible because I just would rather, if I want it, I buy it and that's that. Yes. Um, but that, that's a fantastic thing to bring up. Yes. And, you know, Audible, uh, I had a friend show me recently, uh, look, Neil, I listen to 12 books a month, but I only pay for one token. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, on Audible, you can just press return. I didn't like it. I return. I didn't like it. Return. I didn't like it. And I thought, oh my God, Jeff Bezos has figured out a way to rob the money from the publisher and the author, but he still gets the token price, which all he cares about. Is anyway, I could go on a rant. I'm not going to, I'm going to hold myself back. Um, Susan, the last, uh, opening, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the one hour opening. The last opening quote is about your leads. I read and listened to a ton of interviews with you in preparation for this. My absolute favorite of all was your 2004 interview with University of California writing on the edge editor, John Bowe, B-O-E, which he's very kindly put up online as a 10 page PDF. Um, and here's the quote. It's the last one I have before we get into your three books. <clears throat> I think, and you're discussing leads. For those that don't know, that would be the beginning of your articles or often the first sentence, if I have it right. You're famous for your leads. Maybe you can tell us a few of the most famous ones in your answer to this, which is, I think it's the nature of a really good strip tease act that you've got to choose very carefully which item of clothing you're going to take off first. Because it's got to be enough but not too much. And it has to be arresting so that you think, hmm, what comes next? <laughs> you know, the strip tease metaphor, I keep going back to it because it does feel like that to me. And right now I'm, I'm working on a memoir and I'm writing um, a long section about uh, a story of mine that got a lot of attention called The American Man Age 10. I've read it, and oh, by, I should have said this, Susan, I didn't, and, I, and I apologize, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, 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 the, the bullfutter checks uh, her makeup, the collection of New York articles that I'm holding up on the screen here, was added to our top 1,000 list already by our guest in Chapter 95, Bess Kalb. So you're, you're, in addition to being our guest oh, now, your, nice. your book is already on our top 1,000, this one. Well, that's and in, really cool. Yes, and in Best Calb, for those that don't know, is a comedic genius who, do you know her? Um, we are, uh, we never met in real life. We've oh, okay. met. Right, <laughs> wonderful. So for those that know, she's just I don't know what that a, term is. I think yeah, of her as a friend, even yeah. though we've never met. Oh, she's a Twitter wonder kind, et cetera, et cetera. But the, uh, back to you, but that, that essay you're talking about is collected in this collection. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, it originally ran in Esquire magazine, and I was writing about the lead because the lead Hi, Neil. Um, I just, uh, wanted to say I really was enjoy your very podcast. Uh, quirky. Uh, what was it? And the lead was, and went over uh, your three it was a profile of this 10-year-old boy, well, Colin Duffy. Enjoy. Um, and the lead and begins, really cool um, if Colin Duffy and I were to be um, ma get married, we would have matching down, superhero uh, notebooks. Right <laughs> and it <laughs> goes on from there. And, and, um, and you know, I guess speculating on what it's like to be yeah, married to a 10 year old boy would strike <laughs> people <laughs> as <laughs> unusual. <laughs> uh, and I was trying. Some people. Yeah, some. And so in the. Um, course of working on this uh, part of the memoir, I I was, in, you know, acknowledging that some of writing a lead, you can't explain. Um, it, And in a way, I think you don't want to. I mean, some of it is just some intuitive 
sort of flash that happens. Yeah. yeah. And that is usually coming out of somewhere other than the newspaper maxim of, you know, who, what, where, when, how. Right. <laughs> um, because it seems to me not at all important to address that in the first line of a of a magazine piece, of a book, of, you know, we're not talking about a newspaper story. Um, and that I love the idea of having people startled or mm. taken by surprise enough or have some emotion so they go, wait, what? Mm. I have to keep reading this, which is, of course, the whole point. I mean, you want people to go, wait, 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 I've got to read this. So, um, and I think leads are incredibly important and become more and more and more important as our attention economy Mm. um, is flooded by things demanding that we tune in. So you Ah. have one bid for a reader's attention, and if you don't make it powerfully, uh, you're probably not going to get it. Devastation is central and immediately Right, and you do a lot with your leads, and so I cannot take, I cannot miss the chance. I'm going to flip randomly through the Bullfighter Checks Your Makeup right now. I'm going to give you three of your own leads, and you're going to tell us why they work. And we know that they work, because they've all been immortalized in arguably the top literary publication in the world, The New Yorker and or Esquire, etc., and then further curated to a best-selling book featuring you on the cover in yeah. a dress. Okay, so I just flipped randomly. I have, not, I have not read this particular piece before. It's called Tiffany. One thing that Tiffany, Tiffany's manager, and the entire Tiffany organization would like you to know is that even though it may seem too good to be true, Tiffany's real name is really Tiffany. This was a profile of a young uh, teenager who you may have never heard of who became a singing phenomenon named Tiffany. Oh, I think I'm alone now. I think Uh, we're alone now. Yes. Yes. And she got her start singing in shopping malls. Um, She was, you know really a big deal for a short amount of time (laughs) and it always seemed so uh, you know she was known by one name Tiffany it was uh, um, like as opposed to two names right as opposed to Tiffany Smith or you know (laughs) her name was Tiffany and there was something so much of the moment, I forget what year I wrote that piece, but it was probably in the 80s. Yeah, I don't know. And, you know, the name Tiffany was so much of the moment mm-hmm. and such a perfect one name name Yeah. that, you know, part of you would be inclined to think, well, that's probably like a stage name. Right. But in fact, it was her real name. And, and, you know, the story was, of course, about how much of her was artifice and how much was authentic. And also it was fun to just repeat the name Tiffany. Like right, five right. No, no, so. that's, that's a really good point, <laughs> right? No, that's great. Like, like repetition of the same word five times in a sentence is something most people have never seen before, right? Unless they're doing that Buffalo game in grade school. Right. Um, uh, a gentle rain begins with this phrase. Kwabina Opong, who is the king and supreme ruler of the African Ashanti tribes people living in the United States of America, has a throne in his living room. So this story, which was uh, my first full-length feature in The New Yorker, oh, uh, was very meaningful to me. 
uh, was about a um, wonderful man, Nana Apong, who was a cab driver and was also, as it turned out, the king of, the, of his tribe in the United States. So he lived in a housing project in the Bronx and he had a, a life of tremendous contradiction. On one hand, he was a, very much a working class man with young kids and struggling just the way you can imagine a cab driver would struggle to make ends meet and, and live comfortably. On the other hand, he was the revered, honored king of his tribe who, oh my gosh. you know, was treated with enormous respect and approached by his tribe's people to help mediate disputes or solve problems and you know, was had all of these beautiful uh, robes that were the kingly wardrobe. And so the contrast of this very modest living room in the Bronx in a housing, not a project, but a government housing, um, working class housing in the Bronx. But he had a throne. So wow. his, his life was such a matter of crazy contrast. Yeah, and you got uh, all that across in one sentence. I felt like it was the a, a way that I could signal the tremendous contradictions of his life without saying, wow, it's pretty weird to be a cab driver but also be king. Like that's lesson. another that's another that's another lead that you that was the second or third option there right exactly uh, oh my I gosh I, I can't choose because there's so many i'm flipping as we talk as you can see uh, i gotta go with this one but I, I looked at three and they're all great but i we gotta get into your three books but here's the last one this this piece is called shortcuts robert stewart ran away from home when he was a teenager used to be macrobiotic Worries that Republican welfare reform might lead to urban violence. Thinks Hugh Grant is good looking, but not amazing looking. Is a Nietzschean. Has been faithful to his wife since they met 17 years ago. And planned to become a social worker, but ended up a hairdresser. <laughs> uh, well, this is a story that I had an absolute blast doing, which was... Well, one day I was getting my hair cut and I was just observe. and this was, he was my hairdresser and his salon was fairly sm small so that you could kind of hear everybody talking and I just was listening to all the conversations and sometimes people would eavesdrop on the person in the chair next to them and sort of I interrupt and give their two cents and Robert himself is quite voluble and would be, you know, holding forth and chatting. And I thought, you know, women's hair salons really are this kind of beehive of conversation. And this one in particular, because Robert is such a chatterbox and has had such a crazy, um, you know, he's had a life with many different chapters. Um, and I thought, I just want to spend a week in this hair salon and try to capture the sense of this river of conversation that's constantly flowing. Oh, and wow. Robert's um, sort of the captain of the ship as it's uh, making its way on this river of conversation. So I liked starting with this kind of jumble of yeah. information because that's what it felt like to sit there for hours every day that you could on one, one minute be talking about Nietzsche and the next talk about um, hair color. And then the next talk about yeah, uh, uh, Hugh Grant being macro macrobiotic and then about Hugh Grant. And yeah. 
Now, lest people think that all your leads are long, because we've talked a few long ones, uh, the bonus one in this game is The Three Sisters, which is the name of the piece, and the opening line is only um, eight words, and it goes, In Bulgaria, some tennis balls are like dumplings. I do love that lead. Um, the story was a profile of three sisters who were Bulgarian tennis pros. I followed them on the tennis, um, on the pro circuit for a couple of weeks where they played in the French Open, they played, uh, we went all over the place. And they were living, you know, the life that you might imagine of tennis pros that uh, it's not exactly glamorous, but certainly um, it, it elevated. Yes. But they had come out of a culture that was at that time still behind the Iron Curtain. Oh, interesting. Very impoverished. Right. And they could barely get decent tennis balls to practice with when they were kids. And their mother, who was hilarious and who traveled with them, was the one who said to me, you know, oh, we got the worst, the balls were all flat. They were like like dumplings. And I, <laughs> and of course, dumplings are such an Eastern European food too. Yeah. It was like, oh my God, this is so perfect. Oh. Um, so it was really fun. I had a great time doing the story and and, you know, it was very interesting to be on the pro tennis circuit for a while and see what that life was like. Behind the Iron Curtain. Well, they were... Um, oh, they were like, uh, like yeah, ranked. I mean, I they are at the U.S. Open or the Australian yeah, Open. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I went yeah. with them to the Swiss Open and the French Open. And, oh, wow. Um, you know, we were... I, they were traveling around the world on the circuit along with American players and, you know... Canadian players. See, and this is the cool thing. I hope your memoir's got a chapter just on the tennis on the on the, the tennis circuit. That'd be cool. Oh my god, I feel like my memoir is gonna be five billion pages long because <laughs> there are so many stories I wanna tell and uh. You know, you're, 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 you're having to be prolific about your pro prolificosity. Yes. Um so Okay, that was one of our, that wasn't just a moose bouche and like, you know, that was like, we got, we threw some inner mezzo, some palate cleansers, some appetizers. Yeah. Now the listener, I want them to feel like the lead of the whole three books conversation has been properly, evocatively introduced. Right. We got that nailed down. We got that nailed down. And now it's time to jump into your three most formative books. And so for those that are new to the show, I am going to try to give the listener um, a 30 to 60 second uh, overview of each book with the intent of having them feel like they're visually holding it. So your first book is The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. That's F-A-U-L-K-N-E-R. Originally published in 1929 by Cape and Smith in the U.S. and Chattel and Windus over in the U.K. I am holding right here a 1990 vintage international trade paperback with ominous purple-pink clouds, clouds. The Sound and the Fury in a thin, tall, white, windswept font below a massive, Lino block styled giant all caps Faulkner, which is black against a gold ribbon. William Faulkner was born in Mississippi in 1897 and died in 1962 in Mississippi. Not many authors land where they started. He is the Nobel Prize winning writer known as one of the best American writers of all time, and he's often rated the very best Southern U.S. writer. From the back of the book, I'm going to read it right now. It says, one of the greatest novels of the 20th century, The Sound and the Fury, is the tragedy of the Compson family, featuring some of the most memorable characters in American literature. Beautiful, rebellious Caddy, the man-child Benji, haunted, neurotic Quentin, Jason, the brutal cynic, and Dilsey, their black servant. Um... 
I will read simply two of the blurbs on the back. There are more. From Ralph Ellison, it says, For all his concern with the South, Faulkner was actually seeking out the nature of man. Thus, we must turn to him for that continuity of moral purpose, which made for the greatest of our classics. <laughs> In my boldest fantasy, Susan, I would never receive a blurb like that from, from Ralph Ellison, of all people. Yeah. And then from Edmund Wilson, um, you know, Wilson may be best known for kind of hanging out with the Hem Hemingway group. He says, Faulkner belongs to the full-dressed post-Flaubert group of Conrad, Joyce, and Proust. Wow. File this one, Dewey Decimal Heads, like Susan and I, in 813.52 for literature slash English North America slash American fiction slash 20th century slash 1900 to 1944. Susan, please tell us about your relationship with The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. I was introduced to this book um, in high school. It was assigned as reading in my AP English class. Ooh. I, in Cleveland? In Cleveland, Ohio. And mm -hmm. I have no uh, southern roots. I have no attachment to the South. But the story of the South, of course, is the an American story, regardless. I had never read writing like Faulkner's. So my first reaction was to this extraordinary uh, craftsmanship, the artistic structuring of sentences, the, the gorgeousness of, um, of the writing, I was swept away and swept into this fictional world, a, a fictional county in Mississippi that he writes about in a lot of his books. And the story of the family, and really it's a book about the family, the, the tragedy of the family. At the heart of it, in many ways, it's the tragedy of slavery, of the... And, and this family, each individual in the family is its has their own narrative that becomes really compelling. And I just was, my breath was taken away. I felt absolutely drawn into the story. Books about families fascinate me. The, the way that Faulkner toggled between the intimate story of the family and the bigger story of the South struggling with the legacy of slavery was just masterful. And, you know, I do love fiction that does that, that tells a very uh, intimate story, but in a context that is a character in its own right the context of, of when and where the story takes place. I, uh, and in fact, I would say probably all my favorite books um, have that quality. Toggling? Um, just an intimate story and, you know, stories about families really interest me, but then uh, a context that tells you something about the world in general. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, reading yeah. this book, I just... The, the you know, wear of the book. Exactly. And, you know, for a long time, I was fascinated by Indian fiction because um, you know, I don't know that much about India and so many of the great books, um, great Indian literature, you are also, you're learning about India itself and mm. even the politics and the, mm. you know. Um, so, sorry to interject there. Uh, my dad's from India. I've never been, sadly. Is there a couple of books that you would just throw in for the novice Indian oh, fiction absolutely. reader? absolutely. Like um, The God of Small Things, mm. um, mm -hmm. a, um, uh, a Fine Balance by mm. a Mystery, 
Mm -hmm. um, there, are, God, there's so many. Those two instantly. come to mind. Yeah, those pop oh, out. The yeah, first no. one is, uh, I think, by Roy R R Y Booker Prize winner, and the fine balance is by, as you said, Mystery M I S T R Y. And they are both very, very specifically stories about the individual characters, but you learn so much about, you know, the history of India impact impacts people also in the in very intimate ways. Um, the legacy of the South and in particular slavery, but the entire saga of the South is played out on an individual level. So The Sound and the Fury, I think was perhaps one of the first times that I, I felt so drawn into a, a new world, but also incredibly attached to the characters as people. I, the book, I, I loved it so much that I started rereading it while I was reading it. Oh, so I was wow. reading it in two different places. And part of that is it's also not an easy book. Um, no. <laughs> you know, it's challenging because... Stream of consciousness, they call it in some, in some places. They yeah. They refer to and, that as that phrase. And one of the characters is um, developmentally delayed. So his chapters are very um, ab uh, kind of impressionistic. And Faulkner doesn't tell you, here's the story, here's mm -hmm. the relationships. You, you have to understand it. The more you read it, the more you begin to see, oh, I get it. Quentin is the older brother and... Um, the, it, you know, it just takes some time. Yeah, that's not, it's not paint by numbers. No, and, but it's immersive. And yes. the more you are immersed in it, the more you begin understanding what it's all about. Yes, yes, wow. I mean, it's a very like melancholy a book. It's very tragic. There are moments that are very funny. Uh, but it really is about the, the, the sort of collapse of a family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, epic collapse. The tragedy of the family, the tragedy of slavery, the legacy of the South, the toggling between the uh, micro and the macro, and the phrase, I loved it so much I started rereading it while I was reading it. And I know exactly <laughs> what you mean, because I have two um, bookmarks in one of your other books right now. Um, that's maybe because of jumping around, but, but I'm doing it. And, and the lead, by the way, because we, we shared that conversation about leads on The Sound and the Fury is, through the fence between the curling flower spaces, I could see them hitting. And that gives you a good idea of some of the challenges of the book, which is you you hear that and you have no idea what is going on, who's talking, where are we, what era is this. Um, and the first chapter is told through the voice of Benji, the son who is disabled. Mm -hmm. So, and you don't understand that at first. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what you don't understand, for instance, is He's talking about men hitting, and you immediately think of violence, and only. I think, yeah, I was thinking baseball. Oh, okay, because it's people golfing, right? Right. And, um, <laughs> you know, but neither of you correct. <laughs> it's it's also funny because you know you begin with a word that you, and there's a lot of violence um, implied in the book. Yeah. Um, but in fact, what they're, when, you know, you hear the word hitting and in, it's yeah. actually associated with just people playing yeah. golf. 
Um, you know, yeah, and there's also the N-word on the first page, which I, um, you know, you just don't see much any, anywhere anymore. And, and, and I know you posted on social media recently that you really liked the movie that Leslie and I, my wife and I just saw, and we really liked, which I don't think many people have seen yet. So we'll both just say it. It's a called American Fiction by Cord Jefferson, his first ever feature film. And it opens with the N-word on a, on a blackboard. And a, a woman disgruntled in the college class storming out, a white woman saying, right. I can't agree with this. And of course, the professor is black. And he right. says, you know, and there's so there's a lot of I'm not saying that comes out necessarily in Faulkner, but like there's there's the, the racial high definitionness of this book is unusual in our current culture. Right. And of course, that's so much of what Faulkner wrote about was the legacy of slavery and the the sort of original sin nature of slavery that having engaged and and permitted slavery for as long as we did we are forever burdened with it cursed with the responsibility of having done this immoral thing and so, you know, there's a lot of sensitivity around language and d- people disagree about whether books of a period using language that we now find uncomfortable um, are permissible because they are about a period of time. But then you see or a movie. said by a character who says or thinks. Right. And then you see a movie like American Fiction where he's trying very hard to needle you about the the sort of overreaction to language. And um, I mean, I thought the movie was just brilliant. It was and brilliant. Where do you net out on that conversation that you began that you said there's a conversation today about what words can be used? Do you have a point of view or a stance that is helpful for us well, who are I still forming ours? I, I, I feel like there are probably many different ways to look at this. I think um, going through, you know, Mark Twain and deleting language is not a good idea. And that... Or Raul Dahl. Yeah. I mean, that part of learning how to put have perspective is being exposed to things that at one time were I mean in the case of Faulkner he's using the language that was used yeah and yeah I feel like that's kind of the point and the fact that it is uncomfortable or shocking that it's used so casually is part of the point. And right, I just right, think right. it's a giant mistake to go through and say, well, we're going to kind of tidy this up. Yeah, otherwise it's newspeak. Yeah. Um, so uh, many ways we could go here. Faulkner, uh, one thing I've been wrestling with myself that I'd love to get your perspective on because you know you've achieved a tremendous amount of success it's some it's uh, i think you're one of the top nonfiction writers in the world period and oh my God, thank you i you are and and you know faulkner uh he got some big prizes too <laughs> um uh, of course the best known of them being the nobel prize uh in writing and um there's this conversation i think happening in the world right now oriented around Stephen Pressfield's famous book, The War of Art, where he encourages people to go pro. Pressfield, of course, is a movie writer, most famous for writing The Legend of Baker Vance and many others, but he's taken on a second life as sort of a self-help coach where all my friends, you know, Rich Roll was a, was a podcaster, very famous one, and he, he, he puts The War of Art as one of his three most formative. Many people have Humble the Poet has on this show, and it's all about going pro, turning professional, going pro, becoming, you know, committing to the chairs, committing to sitting down and writing, committing to, it doesn't matter, day after day, 7 a.m., as David Sedaris told us in Chapter 18, I write on Christmas, I write on my birthday. Like, there's a, there's a professionalism there, and you're a successful professional as well. 
And you also, you know, the barbershop for a week or the salon for a week, you have maintained an ability to sort of gather up the cultural refrains of the bus, regardless of the fact that you live in an elegant mid-century modern LA home, you know, with your, you're, and you're writing for the New Yorker, you know, that's uh, there's not many quote unquote stuffier mags. And, and I don't use that word negatively. I, I love the New Yorker. I'm just saying, you know, let's talk about that. And Jonathan Franzen has a quote that I came across, and he's a future guest. I'm interviewing him next month. And his quote is, I take a certain amount of pride in not being a professional and apparently being a lifelong amateur, period. I don't want to be slick, period. So I'd love you to just open up what I've tried to paint as two sides of this view. You are a professional by any regard. Do you Think of yourself as an amateur. How, how do you come out on this view? Uh, and it's with an well, with an eye towards coaching future and current writers. Yeah, um, I I would disagree with Jonathan Franzen. I don't think being a professional necessarily means being slick. I think being a professional means having the discipline to um, to get your work done and to um, work hard and not let not give in to um, I mean, I, I just cannot believe that he really means. Uh, it, I it's a 15 year old guardian interview. So I'm, I'm also grabbing yeah. what I like. And you know? I think yeah. I'd like to feel that amateur, that I'm both a professional and an amateur in the sense that I bring to my work the same degree of joy and surprise that I have felt since the very beginning and wow. that mm -hmm. I don't uh, look at it as just got to make a widget. Um, but when it comes to work habits and discipline, I'm very much a professional I am, and I'm proud of it. I feel like when it comes down to it, I sit down and I, think and I look at my notes and I, you know, I look at my deadline and I get into work mode. Um, so I don't see a conflict between having that kind of orderly um, drive, which I think of as professional and having the vulnerability and openness that an amateur might have. Wow. 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 I bring the same, I bring to my work the same degree of joy and surprise that I have felt since the very beginning. I don't see a conflict between orderly drive and vulnerability and openness, which makes, which begs to me the follow-up question of how do you retain, how do you retain the connection to all of humanity, which you so that's your pieces. Like, that's what you do. You, 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 the unconventional eulogies is all about the like, wow, how'd she get into that little tunnel? Like, mm -hmm. and you do so without airs, which I think would be hard to do after 30 plus years at the New York. Like, how do you maintain a groundedness? Well, writing is very humbling. And if you think because you've written lots of books or written for the New Yorker or had a bestseller that the next sentence you write is going to be easy. You are sorely mistaken. Oh, wow. That's nice. <laughs> and, um, it, it is. So the humility, uh, and, and respect for how hard it is, um, is very grounding. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. I think that uh, when I go in, I go into each story, and particularly, for instance, those obituaries. Each one was a world that I knew nothing about, and um, unless you're really a jerk, you're going to be, you know, enter it with that the humbleness of thinking, you know, I really don't know anything about uh, rattlesnake wrestling, you know, and I'm writing an obituary of a guy who, you know, was a rattlesnake wrangler. <clears throat> I don't know anything about it. The fact that I write for the New Yorker or yeah. had a seller doesn't make me any more capable of writing yeah. the story. Yeah. And I still have to say, tell me, tell me what it takes to uh, wrestle a rattlesnake. Yeah, what's a, what's a, what's a rattlesnake wrestler? Right. Yeah, and um, this is the way I summarize the popular nonfiction book Range by David Epstein, where I tell people my version of that book is, your learning curve is the steepest when you know the least. Yes. And if I may, it's maybe a bit more personal, but I'm thinking about this with relation to my kids. Yes, it doesn't make your next sentence easier, but Austin Gillespie, age 19, um, has a mother who has achieved great success. And arguably, my kids have someone who's achieved less success, but has some success that they can see and feel, and they haven't done it, and they haven't done anything. Uh, <laughs> how do you ensure humility in your kin? That's tougher, um, honestly, because they see the parts of it that are glamorous, and they don't necessarily have the ability to feel what it feels like to sit here and think, I cannot think of the next sentence and what comes along with that, which is to say, I'm not going to, I, I've lost it. I, this is the piece that I'm not going to be able to write. And the, which happens every piece. Yeah. To, and, just to uh, tell anyone who's writing, as we all know, as every writer knows, as David Mitchell has said to us, as George Saunders has said to us, as every freaking writer has said to us, it happens every piece that you feel about. Every that way. piece. <laughs> and, you know, to a much lesser degree, every sentence, <laughs> certainly every piece. And yeah. you sit in front of your computer with the conviction that this one is the one where it's all gonna fall apart. So my son, you know, I might tell him that, but it doesn't land for him. Whereas he'll see my book in a bookstore or- um, An invitation to the New Yorker festival or- uh, Something <laughs> sort of wonderful and glamorous and he'll have the, of course, the feeling of, oh, wow, you know, this is really fun and cool. Like, I love this job. So you're not going to give me parenting advice, which I'm at, which I, which I was hoping you for? You know, I, I, I would love to, since <laughs> why not? But, um, I, I try, now that he's older, I try to emphasize to him that this didn't, come about because I didn't work hard. This is, you know, in large part because I really did work hard and I really did show the work calm and write uh, mm -hmm. when it would have been more fun to go goof around. Mm -hmm. And I really did uh, need to discipline myself. Um, mm -hmm. And I think at, his age, it it's clicking more than it might have when he was younger. Yeah, and you know, kids grow up as we all know, you know, differently every year, generation. But the focus on showing the work, I think, is really brilliant and magical, and we try to do that here as yeah. well. Um, okay, let's move on to your second book. This one blew me away. I it is our 
third Tom Wolf book on our top <gasps> 1,000. So remember, we're collecting a um, uh, thousand formative books total. So it's worth mentioning that in chapter 15, uh, Tuesdays with Maury author Mitch Album gave us The Right Stuff by Tom Wolf, which I read the first hundred pages of Love, but didn't get through. And then in chapter 21, um, Franklin the Turtle author Paulette Bourgeois uh, gave us The Bonfire of the Vanities, which knocked me off my feet and I went immediately into a man in full and that knocked me off my feet and then I went and then I was like oh my god OMG Tom Wolf um and now here we have as your a Susan Orleans the Susan Orleans second most formative book we have indeed here it comes everybody the electric Kool-Aid acid test speaking of leads by Tom Wolf file this one under 306 Dewey Decimal Heads for social sciences slash social sciences sociology and anthropology slash culture and institutions yes right there in the backbone because this is a fresh glossy still in print 432 page picador press 2008 edition of the original 900 1968 that'd be 1968 if i was reading my right stuff properly farrar strauss and Giro book uh, when it was originally published my version is a paperback with this as you can see slick shiny cover that fades from black at the top to a dusky twilight blue near the bottom across the top in an all caps yellow green uh, is the big bold phrase Tom Wolf? This W O L F W O L F E W O L F E. So the E at the end for those that don't know Tom Wolf. And below are two images. Number one, the first image is the phrase "The Electric Kool Aid Acid Test," written in a rainbow wavy tie dyed colored hippie style of twisted words. This book, of course, partly being given the cultural credence of kicking off the hippie movement in its documentation of the 1964 bus ride across America by Ken Kesey and his group of merry pranksters. Then, of course, the second image is a pencil type drawing of the rainbow colored but bus, importantly, interesting to note, not day glow because day glow had not been invented yet, but they used um, primary colored paint. Uh, uh, Ken Kesey lived from 1935 to 2001. He was the author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and his evolving and rotating group of 12 to 16 merry pranksters included famously Neil Cassidy, the basis for Dean Moriarty and Jack Kerouac's On the Road, and future members of The Grateful Dead, including Carolyn Mountain Girl Garcia, partner to Jerry Garcia, on their wild, drug-infused, neon-rainbow school bus drive across the United States in the summer of 1964. Again, sometimes considered the or one of the cultural kickoffs to the entire hippie movement. Tom Wolfe, born in Richmond, Virginia in 1930 and lived 88 years to 2018, dying very sadly only two months into the start of this show. So I will never sadly ever be able to invite him on the program. Uh, Susan, tell us about your relationship with the electric Kool-Aid acid test by the one and only Tom Wolfe. This was certainly a formative book for me and probably was, except for school books, um, one of the first nonfiction books of its sort that I'd ever read. So that's very meaningful as a person who ended up pursuing that as a sort Of its sort? Uh, well... You know, when I read it when I was in high school, mm -hmm. um, so it was very close to the time when I read uh, the Faulkner book. But, you know, at that time, new journalism mm -hmm. was really in its early stages. And while we certainly had extraordinary creative nonfiction books, I cringe a little using, but narrative nonfiction books. Yeah, narrative nonfiction, as opposed to Wikipedia-style nonfiction. Right. So, you know, you had Joseph Mitchell and A.J. Liebling, and, you know, there were millions Hunter of... Hunter Thompson. You know, uh, and Hiroshima by John Hersey, and there were brilliant narrative nonfiction being published, but... Oh, I see, yeah. I hadn't... To my knowledge, I had not read much at that point. It was certainly not taught in school. Um, the nonfiction I read were, was history books and, you know, fi and then otherwise it was fiction. Anyway, somehow or another, I got, I think my brother told me about this book 
And for what it's worth, I was really into the Grateful Dead, so I began, at, you know, just curious about the Grateful Dead. The book had an impact on me as much about the way it was written as what it was written about. Tom Wolfe wrote the way no one I had ever read wrote, and certainly no one had ever written nonfiction the way he wrote it that I had read. And, you know, I think that we all kind of agree that he was one of a kind, and in fact, I would say at least one generation of people, if not more, um, were burdened by the desire to try to imitate him, mm. which was, um, you know, a fool's errand since mm. nobody could imitate him. He's, I mean, he was inimitable. Uh, that was his voice, and that was, but he, it, it was the first time it dawned on me that you could do this sort of immersion journalism, really be embedded in a subculture, but still remain a journalist and still, because he was an absolutely a journalist. No one was less of a hippie than Tom Wolfe. <laughs> so, you know, he, he was embedded in that world, but nobody would have ever mistaken him for a hippie. Uh, <laughs> But he was an incredibly voracious reporter, and he could make himself, um, he could enter these subcultures and observe them. He was extremely funny, quite cynical, but also deeply empathic. I mean, he wrote out of a real desire to understand these subcultures and to illuminate them. Um, and in the very best sense, without judgment, even though, you know, he could both make fun and be sarcastic when necessary, but you always felt that he had one mission in mind, which was to show you this other world. So that's where his empathy arose from, which is my mission is to show people the world of Ken Kesey and this extraordinary youth movement that's unfolding and this drug culture that's unfolding. What I personally think about it, it's, I'm not going to hide it from you, but that's not really the problem. You know, it's the difference between an op-ed writer and a reporter, which is an op-ed writer, what's primary is for them to let you know what they think about a subject. Whereas a reporter like Tom Wolfe, and, you know, I certainly feel inspired by that, I feel like it doesn't really matter what I think, although I'm not going to hide from you what I think, but what I'm really here for is to be your um, your Virgil and to show you this world that I've uncovered. And, you know, it comes up all the time that you write about things that you have an opinion about. Yeah. You've wrong. even said every decision you make about what you write is even a moral choice, you've said. Absolutely. And I think that it's wrong to think you can't both be empathetic and opinionated. Um, I think one of the most interesting examples of that in my experience was writing a story about children's beauty pageants. Mm -hmm. I've read that story. Um, you know, it was a real challenge because I had very strong opinions about it, namely that they were very disturbing to me. But my mission and what I cared about deeply was not to tell you my opinion, but 
to explore that world, which my strong opinion was based on no exposure to that world. I'd never been to a children's beauty pageant. I didn't know anyone who had been in a children's beauty pageant, so I felt like as a writer, it really was compelling to me to go look at this world, and in a way, even more compelling because I had a strong opinion about it based on a knee-jerk reaction, and I came out of the experience still feeling strongly that I didn't like them and wouldn't participate and had real misgivings about whether they were really good for kids, but um, my, my mission was to say, come with me and I'm going to show you this world that most of us have never been exposed to, and we don't know why people do them, but I'm going to try to tell you that. Wow. Wow, what a great way to put it. It doesn't really matter what I think, although I'm not going to hide it from you. Um, you said um, a few earlier in your riff um, that this was formative to you in both how it was written and what it was written about. So do you want to take us down the ladder rung of both of those two points? How was it formative in terms of how it was written? How was it formative in terms of what it was written about? Tom Wolfe showed me that you could take a subculture, and in this case it was, you know, the sort of hippie drug culture, and particularly this Ken Kesey's little band, um, and write about it and have it be important. Um, it, it seemed to me that he was saying, examining subcultures is valuable. It's meaningful for us to know, you know, the way yeah. other people are living. So his yeah. giving that kind of attention um, validated the idea yeah. that writing about the nooks and crannies of society was really legitimate and important and fascinating and that um, there was an anthropology Ooh. at play Ooh. and uh, you know I think certainly wasn't the first person to do that but in the modern era he he was the greatest practitioner of saying, I'm basically an anthropologist out looking at these tribes that make up our society, and each one merits serious attention and examination. Wow. So that really mattered to me mm -hmm. in terms of the subject. You know, I didn't read this and think, oh, my God. Sorry, gonna... sorry, on, on the subject, and you're going to go into this, but I just want to throw in here for those listening, you said to Debbie Millman when you started writing for The New Yorker, The New Yorker didn't say it was funny or kind of silly, and it will be a place, your pieces, it will be a nice balance to our otherwise serious, important work, but that it was legitimately important. It doesn't have global impact, but it has real impact. It's about how life presents itself. It was intoxicating to me to have that sense of what made a story validated. Yeah. And I think that that is, you know, when you look at a newspaper, um, I'm not throwing shade, but in a newspaper, it's gloom and doom, and then they have the light feature. Yeah, the good news story. And the um, there's a way when those were just seen as the little palate cleanser mm -hmm. before you dove back in mm -hmm. to the doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. And I never, ever felt, first of all, I didn't think these subjects were 
lightweight and unimportant. I thought they were extremely important. And the New Yorker made me, I felt at the New Yorker that they saw it the same way. Yeah. That, um, as, as you saw it, as they saw it, and as Tom Wolf taught you to see it. Yeah. Illuminating uh, the way people live their their lives is meaningful whether what they do is very niche and small and or whether it's uh you know global policy nobody's trying to equate a child beauty pageant with you know the war in gaza but in terms of mattering in your richness as a human being and your knowledge of the world around you. Um, and I don't think we need to say one is more important than the other. Mm. There, it's part of being a citizen of the world that you learn this broad range. And within these little light stories, there's a lot of, darkness and light and humor and tragedy and you know they're they touch on a real range of emotion and and meaning um and i felt that the new yorker that's what the new yorker stood for yeah and 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 despite a relatively much smaller you know, uh, ripple in culture, uh, sadly, because obviously I know all the online series, but a lot less people subscribe to the magazine. And there's just so much more media and so much more content. And I think I think that's what they, you know, I still I what I get when I, especially when I read like a talk of the town piece or something like that, or a great profile, one of those rich, like 10 page profiles that just takes you the whole flight. Ugh. Um, now, yeah. so you've gone deep into the kind of, uh, you said it was formative to you in terms of how it was written and into what it was written about. And so the how it was written, we've really done a nice job opening that up. On the what it was written about, I just give a little bit more context here on what it was written about for people. And then I'd love your, your formativeness here. The electric Kool-Aid acid test has been described as faithful and essential in depicting the roots and growth of the hippie movement including some say even the start of like the rainbow colors, right? Like they painted the bus these colors. Well, think about like tie-dyed shirts, etc. The bus they drive, Ken Kesey brought a generous supply of the then legal psychedelic drug LSD. And they reportedly also took 500 benzedrine pills in brackets speed and a shoebox full of rolled marijuana cigarettes. They were stopped several times by the government, but explained they were filmmakers. <laughs> Until 1965, drug use received little media attention for officials to be suspicious. And so I guess the question that you're letting us repel into, and I appreciate your letting us go here, is something akin to what was your awareness, understanding, and involvement with the culture before and after reading the book, because if I have my math right, you were nine when the Merry Pranksters rode their bike, their bus across the states, 13 when the book came out, and then you read it probably a few years after that. Right. And I was uh, a, really a whole different generation than Ken Kesey. And, um, and I was, you know, in high school, um, this was as exotic, the story of the lives they were living, I mean, it was extremely exotic to me. I was leading a very conventional good girl life in high school. And even though I was a big Grateful Dead fan and went to many, many concerts, um, I was, you know, very, I, I was, and I really was passionate about the Grateful Dead. And I think that was a big part of why the book resonated so much with me. But it did not have the effect of making me think, oh my gosh, I can't wait to drop acid and, you know, do live that he doesn't life. Glorify, he doesn't glorify it. No, I mean, he's very... Um, it's kind of glorified today, maybe, but it's not, it wasn't glorified in this book. No, I think what he glorified was, or I don't, I think he didn't glorify anything. I think 
um, the, he he reveled in the adventurousness and um, inventiveness of this group of people, their willingness to kind of um, head out in, I mean, this was early on. It was not an era where people were in rainbow painted school buses and dropping acid. Um, it's hard for us to believe because it wasn't culture, illegal because it wasn't a thing. It was so early. It's like crypto and, before there's laws about crypto or right, whatever. And I right. forget what your LSD was first synthesized. I, I just don't remember. But it's 50s or 60s for sure. Yeah, so this was definitely up here in Canada, I think. Then we get oh, it from the. Right? I think we got it from the 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 rye plants. I think. I watched the Michael Pollan documentary on LSD. I forget where it was from, but yeah, I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. But um, so, but just to answer your question, I didn't read this and think I want to be part of this. I think that I read it marveling at it, um, you know, loving the insight into the Grateful Dead. Um, you know, at that point I was living in a world that was very influenced by hippie sensibility. So it served as a bit of a history book. Um, but I think how it really influenced me was reading and thinking, I want to, I want to write books like this. But no, no relationship uh, with, drugs or drug culture or hippie hippie culture kind of after the book that you can trace back and say, oh, I started smoking weed or I, I, I certainly lowered my defenses against being open to it or aware of it or I saw some, I went to a lot of Grateful Dead, you know, like there, was there no, um, and we're lucky we're in, a, we're in 2024, so these conversations are, have become a lot more open than they used to be and I'm very happy to um, share my view and perspective and relationship with things like weed and LSD and so on. But I, I just, I would, I would be surprised to hear that Susan or Lee now had no, like, did you not um, get into it? <laughs> uh, well, I, I think like everyone on the planet, I smoked weed when I was in high school and college and experimented with drugs for sure. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't draw a direct connection to the book in any right. way. I think by the time I was in my drug use phase, the book was had been out for quite a long time. I mean, it was no longer something that you would say directly, you know, I read this book, it made me really curious about yeah. trying drugs. Yeah. Um, because, you know, everyone... It, it was such, it was so common yeah. to yeah. smoke pot when you were, you know, in that, well, obviously it's become only more common, yeah. but yeah. Um, it was, I wouldn't draw that connection. And I don't think I looked at them. I mean, look, the, what was more meaningful to me was reading further about drug use and the Grateful Dead and how it went from this exploratory, adventurous, kind of intellectual pursuit, and then the band sort of split between the people who started using heroin, which ended very badly, including, sadly, Jerry Garcia, versus the other people who just stayed with psychedelics and the drugs that were not to numb them out, but to enhance perception. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So that's a really, actually, it's a really good delineation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that that affected me more because Jerry Gar Jerry Garcia's decline and death really upset me. And realizing later, oh my God, Jerry Garcia became a heroin addict. What a yeah. What a dumb thing. Like, he of all people. Um, so, but I would you, say, 
Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't draw any, you know, connection mm-hmm. between my, you know, pretty run of the mill drug use that didn't, yeah. you know, end up being super interesting. And then, and then, uh, and then do you, do you, while we're hanging out here, cause I think it's a fun space, you know, there's that famous Hemingway quote, you know, write drunk, edit sober. Um, yeah. If you asked me, if someone said, Oh, you know, you wrote the book of awesome 10 years ago, what any writing principles, like there was one, I, I would say, you know, sometimes I wrote high and edited sober or, you know, to come up with some of those ideas, I found cannabis to be a helpful um, infusion. Uh, do you see a relationship between drugs and writing in, in any way today? Or no, I mean no? I have never written either drunk or high ever ever. Wow! wow. I just um, it's never occurred to me, and for that matter, I I've never even thought I'll bring a glass of wine out to my office. Never. Oh, I'm interesting. very strict interesting. about it. Um, first of all, I feel like I have plenty of time to drink uh, <laughs> on when I'm not working. But also, I never thought, hmm, I think that could really enhance I mean, and this is just me. Anybody yeah, yeah, no, no. And it, that's why it's fun to a, talk about. You learn everybody's writing right. routines right but right. not bringing a glass of wine to the terrarium is pretty interesting i like that you know never yeah, nev- yeah, never that's interesting in my life and believe me i've i certainly enjoy drinking and we feast uh, on life susan yeah, I yes. mean, I'm not a Puritan. I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not a Puritan, but it it has never struck me as being something that would help me in my writing. And you're, in my you're, writing. You're, 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 yeah, you're writing. That's kind of great to hear, you know. So because because for anyway, there's no judgment here. It's just all in spirit of learning. Now. Book organization. I got to ask you about book organization. The electric Kool-Aid acid test begins in this wild, he's, he starts in the back of a pickup truck, you know, and, and then it's linear and then it's not linear. Like I thought the bus ride was going to be the whole book, but then 150 pages and he's, he suddenly starts saying, I, he starts saying, I, this, I, that. I was like, what? Like this has gone from like, what's going on to like, you're in it. Like, I didn't think you were even in this thing. And so I'm kind of picturing like Tom Wolf having like a hundred cue cards with all these scenes of what happened when he was hanging out with these people. And then like, not just, oh, it was one, two, three, four, but like, how do I braid them together in the most interesting story way? And then you know, why this is interesting for me to ask you is because when I was reading about the library book, when I, I sent you my review of the library book pre-researching you for this interview. So I was, I was couldn't believe that I had written this phrase in my own review in my book club that I send out at the last Saturday morning of every month saying, it feels to me like reading this book is like walking down the shelves of a library. And then, of course, I read you saying the exact same phrase when you were talking about how you organized the book. So I, I both have a question. My question about book organization is, on the library book, how did you actually practically organize it? Like, Feel free to go into any level of detail you're willing to. Like, how'd you think about it? What'd you do on your walls? Did you set up your home or studio in some certain way? How did you think about weaving the threads together? Did you map them out? Like, how'd you organize it? And the reason I'm asking you is because I detect from Wolf to Orlean a similar nonfiction narrative, but not just linear narrative type of approach. Right. And I think, um, I'm sure this is true for Tom Wolf. It certainly is for me. I don't intentionally disregard chronology for the hell of it. Uh, I mean that, you know, or to confuse people. I it that's not it at all. Um, I have a system that I've used now for a long time, which is um, I write. I create index cards, and by that I mean... Oh, she's the, holding them up. Yeah. These big, um, I don't know how many inches these it's are. It's like but about... Uh, five four, by seven. Yeah, or, five by seven inches, or but they're quite big. That's bigger than like, it's like the size of your face, the whole index card. Yeah, and I put um, on each one 
a sort of unit of information. Um, when I wrote the library book, I had over probably close to 700. Um, I then, at that time, I had an office that had a long, long wall that I put up cork board and I organized the cards um, thematically because I felt like that's how I wanted to organize the book was more by theme rather than by chronology, although there were certain sections like the development of the library that needed to be chronological. It would be silly not to be. Um, so I was juggling multiple timelines and but the chronology was never the 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 overarching narrative mm -hmm. other than the fire uh, i guess or at least the beginning of the fire right mm -hmm. i mean so certainly like telling the story of the development of the library and ultimately the mm -hmm. you know um, but I told the fire early in the exactly, beginning. Exactly, exactly. As soon as I said that, I was like, wait a minute, then she didn't actually do that. <laughs> yeah. Right, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I felt like, let me tell you what is the trigger for this investigation and then pull the camera back and start in the 1800s before L.A. had a library and, you know, it was a small city, kind of a cow town, um, Hardly anyone even had books, et cetera, and, and then move forward in time. But at the same time, I interspersed that with sections in which I journeyed through many different departments of the present-day library right, and spent right, time right, right. in... You know, Alma spent time with the security guard, spent time in the yeah. department where they answer phone calls with questions. Right. And, so if you spent time in the department where they answer phone calls with questions, like what's on the cue card then? Uh, that's a very good question. The way it works is if there were great quotes that I wanted to use, I would put those on a cue card. If it was something bigger, like the, or it might be statistics about how many calls they get in a day. So one card might say 2,000 phone calls a day mm -hmm. versus 10,000 phone calls a day 20 years ago. I'm obviously mm -hmm. I'm making this up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then say I had something like a newspaper story about that department that seemed funny, I might have an index card that would say, go to file X where the newspaper story is. Oh, I see. Right. So and then the uh index cards were not all um, of the same nature. But each one was like a unit that could be moved around where I needed to put it. But it, and you say unit, but you mean it represented potentially like, you know, 100 to 1,000 words like exactly. in, in, of prose, you know? Right. I mean, if it was uh, a funny quote, it was going to be plugged in somewhere. And it, it, I just wanted to remember the quote. Right. If it, was statistical information or factual information, which a lot of it was, mm -hmm. then I would put them in order in which I wanted them to, where I thought they would, you know, fit the best. I would yeah. organize them. So am I correct in thinking, and I'm probably not, but just I'm to try to get the process nailed here for the process junkies like me out there. Say you had, so there's one fascinating chapter, there's many, the whole book's fascinating. There's a fascinating chapter on like the history of the library. You know, this guy walks across the state. He like starts the the uh, public the the LA Library or takes over for LA Library. But it's got the history of the library in there. Charles Loomis. And so, if you had like ten or fifteen cue cards on library origin stuff, you then assemble it together with a butterfly clip. Sit down at your 
computer and then you are like, okay, there's a chapter here. I got all the units. So now I got to, right. now I'm spending the time. Now I got to build the word, the, the, the writing. Exactly. It's almost like uh, you go to Ikea, you buy the flat pack, you lay all of the pieces out and some of them are just a screw. Some is a giant panel of wood. Uh, some is some little plastic plug. And you, you know, before you begin building, you, you sort of lay them out in an order in which you kind of can understand how it may come together. And then you begin assembling. In some sense, you're writing the uh, Billy Bookshelf Manual. Precisely, and that's my dream job. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm... No words at all. Around. She just wants to evolve to iconography. <laughs> right. That's, that's exactly. Um, we got to... We got to get to your last book, but I just, you know, Tom, you read this in 60, you know, late 60s, early 70s. Tom Wolf died in 2018. By my math, that gives me almost 50 years where you guys are in the literary world to cohabitate. Did you have any, did you got any Tom Wolf stories of any kind? You know, believe it or not, I never met him. Wow. Uh, oh. Yeah, I, I mean, if I had put some effort into it, I certainly could have. He, we knew many people in common. Um, he had a particular antipathy towards the New Yorker, having written a scathing piece that people still, you know, cringe when they think about it. Um, but I, I would have loved to have met him, and I. I I, it would have been a delight, and I'm sorry that I didn't make the effort. Um, you know, just for the heck you, of it. You didn't have a podcast in, in the 90s that gave you an excuse to do what I do and come tap well, on everybody's exactly. door. <laughs> exactly. It would have been a, it would have been a pleasure. And um, he lived in New York. I lived in New York. It would have been easy to do, but I never did. Not too many dudes walking by in white suits. Right, he would have been easy to recognize. Yeah, 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 yeah. By the way, his quote on why he always wore a white suit is reminiscent of what Casey Neistat, the famous YouTuber, says for why he always wears sunglasses, which is reminiscent of why Jack Nicholson says he always wears sunglasses, which is akin to, and I'm paraphrasing all three of these people, you know, when I'm not wearing my sunglasses, I'm just a regular guy. When I wear my sunglasses, I'm Jack fucking Nicholson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's transition now to your third and final. I can see you're biting your tongue a bit, which I which I appreciate. <laughs> you can you can feel free to say something about that if you want. But like, why is he always wearing a white suit? Because he says, "When I wear a white suit, I'm Tom Wolf." You know, like there's <laughs> something there. It's okay. funny. Your third and final book is, of course, Great Plains, P L A I N S, by Ian Frazier. If I'm saying that right, F R A. Z or Z I E R, originally published in 1989 by Farrar, Strass, and Giroux. Again, I'm holding a first edition hardcover, which I absolutely loved. I have not wow. consumed uh, more than 30% of the words in this book, but I'm hopping, skipping, and jumping around, feasting on this thing like a David Sedaris theft by finding style of diary, but meshed together like more prosy than that. It's a Beautiful, giant, varsity font, great planes across the top half of the dust jacket with a faded big blue sky over a haystack yellow and road gray highway. Ian Frazier is in a black stacked font on the edge of the horizon. He is today the 73-year-old two-time Thurber Prize winning nonfiction and comedy writer born like you, Susan, in Cleveland, Ohio. I open the dust jacket and I see, oh, okay, this is one of my first YouTube interviews. I've been trying to get into this for a few years, but this is a good one. Um, as I'll show on the YouTube here, um, <laughs> the YouTube, um, my incredibly, incredibly vivid end papers with a light orange map of the USA with the Great Plains, in lowercase, from, I'm saying it lowercase, from Montana, North Dakota, up top to Western Texas at the bottom, encircled in a gray shadow with little lines covering famous routes like Coronado in 1541, Lewis Clark in 1804, and of course, Ian Fraser in the 1980s. The flap copy I thought was wonderful. It says, Ian Fraser's new book is about the Great Plains. 
a place people from all over used to visit for adventure, and he still does. The Great Plains are the short grass prairies in the middle of the continent where the Crow and the Sioux and the Cheyenne and the Comanche had a few decades of prosperity between the coming of the horse and the coming of the army, where 40 million buffalo were wiped out in about 10 years, and cowboys drove herds of longhorn cattle north from Texas, where farmers plowed up every foot of sod they owned to plant wheat to feed World War I, and then whole counties blew away in the Dust Bowl. Ian Fraser visits these ghosty places on the plains where the past is more alive than the present, like the site of Sitting Bull's cabin on the Grand River in South Dakota, like a rock shop made of fossilized dinosaur bones, like an abandoned house where Bonnie and Clyde terrorized inhabitants, like the house where the murders of Truman Capote's In Cold Blood took take place, like Nicodemus, Kansas, population 50, founded 110 years ago by black homesteaders. Uh, file this one, Dewey Decimal Heads, under 917.80433 for history and geography, slash geography and travel, slash geography of travel, North America, slash Western U.S., slash travel. Look, Susan, don't you think the DDS is biased? Because it's only Western U.S. There is no Great Plains categorization under 804. Uh, Susan, tell us about your Great Plains by Ian Fraser relationship. I first started reading Ian Frazier when I got my first New Yorker subscription, which was in college. Instantly fell in love. Um, it's not only that he's hilarious. He, he's also a, a writer who has a, an eye for detail uh, that really is exquisite he and he has a, a, a way of um, making you feel you're encountering people for real mm. through his eyes mm -hmm. he's just got the quotes an incredible yeah, yeah. yeah he yeah. he's I instantly thought oh my god I'm this guy is extraordinary. Great Plains, um, and God, I have my same copy that I've had forever, and it's really falling apart, and I should treat myself to a new one, because I look at it all the time. I turn to it frequently. Some of it is just, again, the writing is amazing. It's alternately funny and mournful and... Um, perceptive and and documentarian mm. you know there's a mm -hmm. lot of just wonderful mm -hmm. detail mm -hmm. that he conveys in a way that is um, just it's the most delicious way to learn history and learn uh, geography and sociology and May I yeah. ask you to, yeah. to read the first page? Away to the great plains of America, to that immense western short grass prairie, now mostly plowed under. Away to the still empty land beyond newsstands and malls and velvet restaurant ropes. Away to the headwaters of the Missouri, now quelled by many impoundment dams, and to the headwaters of the Platte, and to the almost invisible headwaters of the slurped up Arkansas, away to the land where TV used to set its most popular dramas, but not anymore, away to the land beyond the hundredth meridian of longitude, where sometimes it rains and sometimes it doesn't, where agriculture stops and does a double take, away to the skies of sparrowhawks sitting on telephone wires, thinking of mice and flaring their tail feathers suddenly, like a card trick, away to the air shaft of the continent where weather fronts from two hemispheres meet and the wind blows almost all the time, away to the fields of wheat and milo and sudan grass and flax and alfalfa and nothing, away to the parts of Montana and North Dakota and South Dakota and Wyoming and Nebraska and Kansas and Colorado and New Mexico and Oklahoma and Texas. Oh exclamation mark on yeah. almost every sentence and you read that well for those that can't see us which is almost everybody because i haven't really done this before i was holding up 
my book on this side of the border. I'm in Toronto, my basement, and, and I, Susan's reading it live from her home in Los Angeles. I just think the world is amazing that we can even do that. It is. It is. Um, she talks to Indians, ranchers, kids drinking grain elevator operators, park service employees, Air Force computer specialists working on nuclear missiles. Yeah. Um, part of what appealed to me so much about the book was he takes the traditional form of a travel book. First of all, go somewhere no one wants to go, which is <laughs> what we, you know, and that's part of the the humor, which Fly is, over states, yeah. you know, yeah. he's saying, hey, I'm going where nobody wants to go and nobody thinks about. Um, but he also uh, embraces the, you know, the very traditional notion of the journey. And he drives to the Midwest and through the Great Plains and talks about the actual journey, driving from place to place and... Um, he shows the um, how the sausage is made. Uh, you know, you're very much taking the journey with him. And, you know, he's one of my very favorite writers, definitely an inspiration. Again, like Tom Wolfe, you know, he, he writes in a way that it's tempting to imitate, but you can never get it right. Hmm. And I had to work very hard to get over my Ian Fraser phase. Oh, where, interesting. Uh, the same way I got over my Tom Wolfe phase <laughs> of, you know, being so enchanted by his writing that I was imitating it. How do you and, get over one of those phases? I'm sure I'm still in at least three. Well, I think that in one reason is I realized I wasn't good at it. And secondly, I, my editor who edited Ian Frazier as well, sort of noticed, <laughs> you know, I think he, he kind of knew that I was so um, influenced and, you know, so fangirling so much that, I was writing in a way that wasn't true to my own um, voice. And, yeah. and, you know, I think imitating people is a great way to learn um, and that everyone should do it and yeah. there's nothing wrong with it. It's, and if you have a good editor, they'll edit that out when the time comes. But it is certainly a way to learn how to write is to read people whose work you love yeah. and say, I want to I want to somehow achieve the same thing but I'll do it in my own voice. Well that's that's so interesting on this topic of voice. Let's pause here just for a second and then we're going to get into our closing fast money questions. Uh, and then I got to weave in Michael Michael Harris's question which I've had sitting here the whole time. Um on voice, so a voice question, a Michael Harris question and then a fast money close and we're done here. Um like when I read the library book, I didn't find it necessarily funny. Like there was descriptions in there of people or things like when you're taking that guy around and he's trying to decide whether or not to move this garden at the back of this distant branch. Like I found like the scene comic, but I didn't, I didn't find it laugh out loud. But then when I listened to you, as I've done for a very generous nearly three hours, and I listened to you a lot before coming in here, I'm like, she's hilarious. Like, I, I keep thinking that. I'm like, you have this wonderful sort of self-aware, tongue-in-cheek awareness of your own obsessiveness, and you, you have such great timing. You pause, you're thoughtful. I'm like, I, and I've laughed a lot just talking to you, like more, you know. And so I wondered if you might tell us the difference you see between your own speaking and writing voices and how other writers might learn to see or think about this. I guess the classic, how you find your voice, but how you right. relate that back to how you actually think and speak now. Well, I certainly, um, I think your ultimate goal always is to try to have your writing sound as much like your actual way of expressing yourself as possible. And I, I think that that seems like such a simple goal, but it's actually very challenging. Um, 
so you're always working toward that and I definitely like being funny and whenever I can and whenever it's appropriate um, I like I like to be funny in my writing. It's not always appropriate, depending. Mm -hmm. um, and I like, I often like being funny when I don't have to tell a joke and instead I show you something that's extremely funny. That's hilarious because, yeah, I like to be funny when I don't have to tell you a joke. Wow. And right. I mean, instead it's me saying, uh, just me. Like the opening lead of the age 10 profile. Right. I mean, I don't tell jokes. I I either like to write something that will make you laugh or I will uh, describe a scene that is funny and I want you to laugh because the scene is funny. Um, you know, finding a voice is the ultimate challenge. Um, and I think uh, the only helpful thing I can say is that... Um, the great surprise is discovering it's it's a little like uh, the Wizard of Oz that you were home all along. Ooh. You know, your voice is the voice you have in the world all along. Oh, and yeah. what makes writing hard is we get tense, we get self-conscious, we, you know, you sometimes feel like you just, don't even know how to say a simple sentence. Yeah. Um, but the truth of the matter, and I find it funny, the more I write and the more experience I have, the closer and closer it is to the way I would have told you the story if I sat down with you and said, oh my God, I'm doing this book about the fire at the LA library. It's the craziest thing. But you don't and record yourself and like replay it and type it out? No, but I am conscious of when I'm talking about stories to people. I feel like I'm test driving sentences or seeing if an anecdote is genuinely as interesting as I think it is. You know, it's always happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. Um I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole there. I'm going to go to Michael Harris. Our guest, so Michael Harris, for those that don't know, is our guest in Chapter 29. I flew out to Vancouver. I interviewed him um, in him and his husband's beautiful apartment, kind of near the mountains. He had a framed uh, poster on his wall of um, an Adrian Tomine uh, New Yorker cover, which you would appreciate, Susan, because it was that one where a guy's like looking up from a subway train. He's He's got his face in the book, and he sees, you know when two subway trains cross, yeah. You can see each other for a second, but then you'll never see them again. Well, but there's someone like a woman, like a pretty girl, like reading the same book. And, and you just know it's like, ah, but he can't say anything because the, the trains are about to go and the set. Oh, it's just beautiful. If I have it right, Michael, as you're listening to this, I hope that's the right cover that you have on your wall in your kitchen. Um, he's also the author of Solitude, which is one of my favorite books of all time. It helped delineate for me that lonely is alone and sad and solitude is alone and happy. <laughs> and um, he also, his new book is All We Want. He was our guest in chapter 29. So he says to you, Susan, Susan, many writers of literary nonfiction bend the truth as, as, as Great Plains is, bend the truth or omit things for the sake of a clean narrative. But your work always feels unafraid of contradictions and complications. How do you react when you encounter inconvenient truths while researching? Oh, wow. That's a great question. And it's very important to me and meaningful to me because we are kind of living in a post-truth society. And I feel that there is such a clear black and white. Uh, things are true or they're not true. Um, facts happened or they didn't. You know, there, it just doesn't seem hard to me to, and I think readers deserve to know that if they're reading nonfiction, it's factual. Um, and that means, uh, certainly, as Michael very correctly points out, that sometimes things just aren't quite as neat as you wish they were. 
I mean, most of the time. In fact, that was my discovery along the way with the library book was suddenly thinking, you know what? Like, nothing is ever neat. Yeah. Real life isn't neat. Mm -hmm. When I started working on the library book, my publisher said to me, oh, you're going to find out who did it, right? Oh. And I said, oh, yeah, of course, thinking yeah, oh, that's 100% not happening. Um, I mean, I'm not a forensic investigator. I'm not going to go 30 years back in history and figure out who started this arson. And I mean, he was hopeful that I would end up being able to determine who did it. And you've just spilled the beans for those that have not read the library book. You don't find out. Right. And look, would it have been simpler to say, bingo, <laughs> we now have the answer? Um, sure, of course it would have been. But that is not the truth. And I mean, let me give you a simpler example, perhaps, which was when I wrote The Orchid Thief, um, part one of the kind of ongoing late motifs in the book is my attempt to see a ghost orchid. Yeah. And this is the orchid, that's the great sort of passion of the yeah. guy I'm writing about and the cause of this whole story to begin with. Yes. I went into the swamp to see the ghost orchid multiple times. <laughs> Each time was its own version of a failure. The last, finally, I was just, I had no time left to write the book, and I had one more time to go, and John LaRoche assured me that there was a ghost orchid blooming, we would go, we would see it, and that would put the cap on my book, and everything would be perfect, and that was how I was going to end the book, with me seeing this ghost orchid, and so on and so forth, and we hike into the swamp, and we got lost, and we never saw a ghost orchid, and I, I was devastated, and I thought, well, this ruins my book. Like, this ruins the book. This was the central conceit of the book, is that I'm going to finally see an orchid. You have to see it to thief it. Exactly. <laughs> and, and then I thought, well, no... That, that's not it at all. I mean, in fact, it's perfectly appropriate that I've never seen it and that that is the nature of passion, which was what the book was all about. And uh. it's never about achieving some sort of conclusive experience or acquisition. It's about wanting. And it was more, frankly, more appropriate that I never saw a ghost orchid. The way most of us never achieve this perfect thing that we aspire to. Yeah. It also was true. I didn't see a ghost orchid. Now, someone else might have thought, well, I'm just going to pretend. Yeah, sure. I'll just, or like, you know, uh, I'll, you'll see one in a museum and just, you know, like you'll, you'll right. figure out a way to make it work kind of thing or something. Right. But I would have certainly never, I don't believe in making things up and to my knowledge I never ever have and never ever will. But secondly, the lesson was there in front of me, which was, in fact, it didn't matter about seeing it. And it, it was more fitting to the theme of the book than if I had. Wow. Um, Would it be easier in all of these instances if things just were tidy? Of course. Of course. Oh, 
Well, I can see why you and Michael are friends because his answer, because I asked him for his answer so I could bounce it off of you oh. after. He says, uh, Susan's work taught me to lean into contradictions. At the start of my writing career, I didn't trust that readers could handle quote unquote messy truths. But now I feel that messiness is actually the joy of great nonfiction. Contradictions become a stamp of authenticity in a way because real life is messy and doesn't offer simple truths. Well, I agree entirely. And, you know, it's interesting uh, uh, with the library book, um, you know, I thought, uh oh, is this going to be tough that I'm saying to people, maybe he did it, maybe he didn't. I mean, we're all very used to watching Law and Order, and you get in like a conclusion. Yeah. And we don't I'm like Lost because it didn't tell us the conclusion. Right. I'm happy to say that I have never, to my knowledge, had a reader say to me, "Yeah, well, I didn't like the book because you never said who did it." <laughs> Instead, I've had many, many people say. Who do you secretly do you think he did it or not? Mm -hmm. And you know, isn't it maddening to not know? Yeah, and it's that's the reality. And that know? chapter Great on point. that dude was unbelievable. Like, I, I that was a read it twice chapter for me. Well, and you know, he passed away. We'll never, or his family, the, the, the quotes from his, like, that, yeah, you just. You did some. There's a magical element to that chapter, particularly so on top oh, of a magical you. book. That chapter where you talk to his family and the way, because you start seeing, like, all these refracted ripples in a water of this dude's life, where he goes, that he, he's ch changing jobs and he's got this real big challenging life, and he's but he's regarded this way from high school, and his family says it this way, and you're like, whoa, like, that's yeah. the kind of stuff books can do that we. I don't think can do as well in film yet. I mean, a great yeah. actor maybe, but like it's hard to get that much complexity on a person, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I was very lucky because I talked to the family, talked to, you know, former lover, talked to people who knew him well, and his... Um, he was a fabulous, and the more I learned about him through these other people, the more that was kind of played. It became real. To yeah. Me. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then again, this is the sort of thing where I feel like the point is this is a guy who told stories, and he sometimes even told stories that were really terrible, like I burned the library down, and you. <laughs> I mean, that his compulsive need to yeah. be a character in a story even included saying that he had done this, you know, very stupid crime. Mm -hmm. um, did he do it or was he just telling the story? Oh, that's partly the nature of storytelling. We yes. Oh, I am feeling... Uh intellectually and somatically satiated in a really wonderful way oh. and I am so grateful uh, to you for I believe because I've listened to every other one the longest interview you've ever done <laughs> I know, and now I'm going to have to do the lightning round because suddenly my life is beginning to you know, unravel Un unfurl a, like I the smoke do down the billowing the billowing <laughs> library steps um, right. Your house says burn down while we've been talking. Well, I the mean, it's, it's, all no, these I'm, questions are lightning round questions, but but you you may as as you know as you can tell take as long as you like on each one. Okay. Um, uh, one question that's been a thread line throughout our our uh, five year odyssey so far is this issue of trust. We touched on it a little bit, and it's uh, related to a book I'm working on. Uh, how do you define trust? Uh comfort, uh, feeling comfortable and being honest. How do you organize your books on your bookshelf? Badly, but um, no, I would say um, I have thematic groupings. <laughs> like I have one section that's all um, books about um, art and 
furniture and architecture. Isn't that, and what, Melville, I, isn't that what Melville Dewey did? Well, yeah, but mine's really bad. Except no, it's the Orlean decimal system. Right. I mean, certainly it is the idea of grouping books thematically makes much more sense to me than doing them like alphabetically. Oh, don't get us into color. A, oh, well, yeah, that's its own thing. That's pop um, it's popular though. I did the books in my old house in the front small bookshelf. I kind of did by color and it looked really pretty. <laughs> Well, yeah. I did it just because I thought. Oh, I mean, I think I was bored. Does one it, day. You know what? You know what? Color organized bookshelf scream to me, and I and this is going to sound nasty, and I'm sorry, but it screams to me. I don't read these. A hundred percent. Because obviously you don't. Because you can't find shit. You know. I know. It's a very useless <laughs> system. But um, do you have a favorite bookstore, living or dead? Oh, ooh, well, yes. Um, it's living, although I no longer live near it, and it's Oblong Books in oh. uh, Rhinebeck, New York. Oh, wow. That's a new one for us on the show. Rhinebeck, New York, Oblong Books. We will shout them out and make a donation yes. to them on your behalf. And uh, favorite library, living or dead? Uh, well, that's a toss-up between my childhood library, Bertram Woods um, branch of the Shaker Heights Public Library, in uh, Ohio, and you know, for obvious reasons, the LA Public Library for having been a marvelous subject. Is it the is it the branch that burned, or any particular yeah. branch? Yeah, yeah, the main yeah. branch. The main branch called the main branch. Yeah. Um, do you have a what's your book lending policy? Uh, I am pretty okay with it if if I've if I've already read the book then I'm happy to lend it out and I prefer getting them back but I also lend with the idea that I may never get them back okay okay good good that's this is you're a you're a you're a role model for me <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I follow Malcolm Gladwell's uh, uh, book lending policy which he describes as grudging um, ah. Uh, is there one book that you would most want to read again for the first time? Oh, well, probably The Satin and the Fury. Yeah. Because um, yeah. I'd love to re-experience what it felt like to read that. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. What it felt like. Susan Orlean uh, assigned this book, AP English, uh, you know, in Cleveland, and is shook by it. How, like that feeling of being shaken. Right. Um, do you have a uh, Do you have a favorite book jacket? Oh, foo, that would be tough. There's so many gorgeous books. I uh, I don't have a favorite. Um, there are too many that I like. Yeah, yeah, and we and we did the nice deep dive on on the library book, which is beautiful. Um, uh, do you have any formative books that we didn't mention in depth on this show that you just want to throw in for our listeners who are capturing Susan's books? Oh, uh, sure. I'll add a couple. Um, uh, a collection by Calvin Trillin called Killings. Okay. Uh, the White Album. Or no, I would say, yeah, the White Album, Joan Didion. Oh yeah, nice. I have I have um, not read that. I've read some other stuff by her. Uh, Just read my first Joan Didion novel ever, actually. Oh. Yeah, first Joan Didion book I've ever read, actually. And oh, I can't even I can't even remember the name of it. <laughs> not it's it's only the rattlesnake on the cover. No, I really like the book, but. I'm um, looking here to see what's on my bookshelf right here, except they're mostly my books, so that would, <laughs> I don't think that would count. No, no, it does, uh, it does, it does. Yeah, no, I mean, in my office, I mostly yeah. have my books, so, um, but those, those two, for sure. Um, okay. Oh, um, one other one, um, it's just because I love it so much, uh, Life After Life by Kate Atkinson. Nice. It's a novel. And Life it's After just, Life. Um, just okay. incredibly brilliant. Beautiful. Novel. And it, mine was played as it lays, I forgot to say. Um, and then to close, and by the way, for anyone listening, uh, every single uh, um, 
thing we mentioned, every every piece of information that we mentioned will be on threebooks.co in the show notes for the show, as long with the full as long with the full transcript, as long with everything. No ads, no sponsors, nothing on the show ever. Um, uh, in addition to telling us where people can find you and how they'd like you to reach you if you would like them to, like what social, because I know you're not on Twitter anymore, and if I'm reading it right, et cetera. Do you want people to send you messages anywhere? If not, that's fine. But if so, where and how? Could you close us off with one final piece of hard-fought wisdom or advice for anyone aspiring towards the North Star of doing some of what you do? <sighs> this will sound perhaps obvious, but why not? Um, read, 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 and then write and write and write. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I mean, not to take too much away from Nike, but really, <laughs> if you love writing and you want to do it, you just have to do it. Uh, exactly. And do you want people to say hi to you anywhere? Uh, well, I'm now on Threads. Um, at Susan Orlean? Orlean. And, um, you made a conscious uh, like step away from Twitter, right? I did. Even though uh, you were prolific on there with like hundreds of thousands right, of followers. Right. I haven't uh, visited my account there in quite a while. And so. there's a reason for that, I'm assuming. Yeah, I just found the um, policies really disturbing. And um, I think, you know, it's just a different place. And right. threads, I've enjoyed being on threads. Who knows ultimately what? It, whether it'll be the place that has some of the fun that Twitter had. I, I mean, not, so far I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. Okay. It's pretty Absolutely. findable. Yeah, you are. And I, I just took a peek at a curiosity that your 359.6 thousand followers on Twitter uh, are still hanging out there with you and your bio, which says writer, 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 period. Oh, comma, I also write, period. I guess that's the same as my uh, my words of wisdom. So Oh, your voice is match. Yeah, appropriate. <laughs> Uh, this has been the gift of my dreams. I cannot even describe to you how grateful and happy I am. Uh, we have a worldwide cadre of book lovers, writers, makers, sellers, librarians, who you just gave hours of unending joy. Thank you so much, Susan. Well, I am so thank grateful. You. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure. I've enjoyed it so much. All right. Hey, everybody. It's just Neil again. Just me. Hanging out in my basement, listening back to that. Soul satisfying conversation with Susan Orlean. You know, after that conversation was over, uh, I went upstairs and I was just so thrilled and I, I just felt so great after that chat. Um, and then Leslie needed a couple things from the drugstore. So I ran out and at the front of the drugstore, they were selling orchids. So I was like, I've never bought an orchid in my life, but to commemorate the conversation, I bought myself an orchid because, you know, the orchid thief and all, and it was freezing. So I ran home. I didn't even take a hat or mitts. Very foolish, classic move. And I got home and I'm holding this orchid and Leslie's like, that's going to die. If you looked at the, le at the leaves, the petals, they had like, you know, lightning bolts, like something was wrong with the orchid. But now it's been a few weeks since we chatted and the orchid is, I'm happy to report it's thriving. It's not a ghost orchid, the one that she was chasing in the book, but as an orchid, nonetheless, it's sitting on our kitchen counter as a bit of a commemoration of this conversation. Cause it was such a good conversation. She is so wonderful. Oh, could you just listen to her all day? I mean, we did pretty close. I think this is the longest conversation she's ever done. I mean, Seemingly, seemingly one of the longest out there. And there's so many quotes that jump out to me. I, I wrote down many of them. And so 
always, if you go on threebooks.co, you'll find patches and patches of quotes that jumped out to me, but I'll give you three right now. Number one, as a writer, I think it's really good to be surprised because that's how you notice things. Sounds obvious, but it is hard to be surprised these days. I mean, even, you know, when you go to a movie, you look at the trailer, when you buy tickets to your sporting event. I mean, now when you buy tickets, it like shows you the view from your seats before you get there. Um, there's so much like previewing. Uh, even when you get, you know, audio notes from people, you can preview it in text. It's like, you're not really surprised much anymore. And it's hard to be surprised because we see everything, right, with the internet. So I don't know, for me, it's like thinking about how I can be surprised more often, how I can not look out the online menu before going to the restaurant, how I can go to the movie and uh, discover the trailer. Wagner Mura, uh, a past guest on three books, um, you know, star of Narcos and a bunch of movies, including the upcoming Civil War by A24. He said to me uh, recently that, isn't it wonderful when you have no idea what the movie is about? And then it turns out to be a wonderful surprise. I wrote that into an awesome thing, by the way, and gave him credit. And it was one of the daily awesome things. But yes, how do you be more surprised in your life? Two, storytelling and knowledge sharing is the essential human experience. Books are just the means by which we do it. It's how we exist together. We tell each other stories. There is a one-dimensionalness of books. Uh, my brain to your brain, uh, a me to you that is, I think... Uh, unequaled by any other form of media consumption. You really do feel like you're in someone's mind. Um, I have recently finished Crossroads by Jonathan Franzen. For anyone that's read Jonathan Franzen books, I mean, there's just so, you're, you're, the first two thirds of that book, like, so 400 pages is one day. And, and on one hand that you're like, oh my gosh, like, how's that possible? Although I just discovered that Ulysses, James Joyce is also one day, but there's the inner thoughts, the inner feelings and why people are doing things and how they feel them. And that, that's the richness that books offer. It would be flattened if it was turned into a movie. I feel. Anyway, I'm going to talk to him soon. So, and I'm going to ask him why none of his none of his books are movies, which seems really weird. There's got to be a reason. Here's another one. Um, writing is very humbling. If you think because you've written a lot of books or written the New York, for the New Yorker or had a New York Times bestseller that the next sentence you write is going to be easy, you are sorely mistaken. I thought this was just a wonderful way to feel because I've been struggling, as you've heard me say many times, like I'm not struggling, but I've been working on this trust book for now seven, almost eight years. Um, and I can beat myself up about it all the time, you know, but but it's it's the next sentence is hard. That's what makes writing enjoyable. It gets edited and edited and edited and it has to be crisp and perfect and good. And then you really have something. So anyway, for writers and writers to be, I hope you found this to be a real masterclass. Like I've, I even went out and bought after this conversation, the exact same size cue cards, index cards that Susan was recommending and the butterfly clips. I, I'm, I want to try this approach on organizing chapters of a book. I think that there's something powerful about the kind of tactile way that she organized a book that really comes through when you read them. And if you haven't already done so, read the library book, as I think everybody should. Now, three more books are added to our top 1,000. We're getting close to the 500s here, people. We now have number 609, The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner, F-A-U- sorry, F-A-U-L-K-N-E-R. Number 608, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test by Tom Wolf, which I highly recommend, especially the first 100 pages, which is really about that bus trip. Uh, Dan the Taylor also tipped us off to that book, if you remember. He didn't use it as one of his three most formative, though. We talked about the Merry Pranks just for the first time in that conversation. And number 607, Great Plains by Ian Fraser, which another book that I just can't recommend enough. The last two I read and loved. Sound of the Fury, I did not get through. I found it too challenging for me. It doesn't mean I've given it up on it. It's just on my bookshelf, and I will tackle it another time. So thank you so much to the inimitable Susan Orlean for joining us on Three Books. 
Are you still here? Did you make it past the three-second pause? If so, I want to welcome you back to the end of the podcast club. This is the club where I talk directly to you. You talk directly to me. We play your voicemails. We read your letters. We talk about the world. We have a post-game after party. It's one of three clubs for three books listeners, three bookers, including the Cover to Cover Club. If you join, drop us a line so we can add your name to our FAQ. Those are people that listen to or attempt to listen to every single chapter of three books. And there is also the Secret Club, which I can't tell you more about, but you can call our phone number 1833 read a lot for clues that is a real number by the way 1833 r e a d a l o t please give me a call i love hearing from you it's just lo- nice to just hear different voices from different places um and so let's kick off the end of the podcast podcast club like we always do by going to the phones Hi, Neil. I just uh, wanted to say I really enjoy your podcast. Uh, my name is Dennis Ide, and I first heard of you on the Rich Wall podcast, and then I immediately went over to listen to your Three Books podcast, listen to the one with Dave Barry, who I've always really enjoyed. Um, and it's a really cool idea, and I'm going to start reading some of these books. Um, my favorite book of all time is Watership Down. Uh, I read it as a, as a, well, maybe a fifth grader in the mid-70s, and it just always stuck with me. I've read it over and over, so... If you haven't read it, maybe check it out. Um, thanks again. I really appreciate it. all you do. Thank you so much to Dennis for the phone call. Finding me on Rich Roll. Nice. Rich is the king. If you don't listen to the Rich Roll podcast, check it out. Rich is just the, I mean, I look up to him in so many ways. Uh, his interviewing skills are just so masterful. And I love that you started with uh, with with Dave Barry. You know, Dave Barry was our guest way back in chapter nine. Um, he gave us three formative books, Chips Off, Chips Off the Old Benchley by Robert Benchley, Very Good G's by P.G. Woodhouse, and The Dog of the South by Charles Portis. Charles Portis only wrote five books, these sort of acerbic, you know, dark, slower kind of comedic books. Austin Cleon um, has emerged as a real fan of Charles Portis. He's kind of like this writer's writer. If you don't know Charles Portis, the Dog of the South is a decent one to start with. He also wrote True Grit by my memory. And I love that your favorite book, former book, is, is Watership Down. Watership Down was also picked by Dr. Jen Gunter back in Chapter 41 as one of her three most formative books. Um, I was trying to wonder what age that is a good book to read, but you said you read it as a kid. I know Jen Gunter said it, she read it as a kid too, so... Maybe it's time to pass it down to people. Uh, Watership Down, coming up again and again. You know, one thing that's great about the show is that it kind of uncovers classics, classics old and new, or classics that, you know, stand the test of time. And Watership Down is absolutely one of those books. Thank you, Dennis, so much for your phone call. All right. Now, let's switch gears a little bit and go on over to the letter of the chapter. All right. Um, Letter of the chapter. This letter comes from uh, AKKA Myth, who sent a direct message to us uh, through social media. Hi, Neil. I'm a fan. I discovered you through your podcast with David Sedaris. This sounds like a really stupid question, but since I have moved to Toronto, I've been here now for two years, I've been dying to know what route you took with him in the car and where that co-working space was that you spoke about. Okay, this is a a very Toronto-specific question, but there's some interesting little trivia tidbits here. Um, First of all, thanks for the question, Um, uh, AKKA, Miss. And um, so, first of all, I picked up David Sedaris at Four Seasons. Apparently, well, David told me this, and his publicist told me this, that David only stays in four seasons. I mean, why not, right? Like, if you're, if you're David Sedaris, you know, you're definitely doing well, but you're working also really hard. These really long performances, you got to stay in nice, crisp, awesome hotels. So like, go to the Four Seasons. I wait outside. There's a black car waiting in the parking lot, the roundabout at the Four Seasons. Uh, I think it was just one in Toronto. And it says David Sedaris in the front. I ask his publicist if I could take a picture when he comes out. She says, no, I know that David doesn't like pictures, so I don't. But I take a picture of the limo with the Sedaris in the front. So that's on the website. If you go to threebooks.co and look up the chapter. <clears throat> Uh, number 18, I believe, chapter number 18. Yes, David Sedaris. And then what we did is we drove to the CBC building. So the CBC building is at John and Wellington, and it was traffic-y. It was like that was his first hit, his first media hit. And so 
we originally thought the conversation would take that drive. I knew that with traffic at that time, it would take like half an hour. But of course, by the time we got there, we weren't even close to finishing the interview. And he was kind enough to let us keep going. So we parked at John and Wellington, went into the CBC building, really famous like red gridlock type building. CBC, for those that don't know, is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And I go up with him. I think he was, yes, he was doing Here and Now, which is the kind of, you know, uh, 4 to 6 p.m. show with, I believe it was with Pia Chana Manning. And he really dug her. She really dug him. I interviewed him a little bit more in the hallways there. And then we went back to the car and then we were driving to Yorkdale because he had an event at the Indigo in Yorkdale Mall. So we drove from John o. Wellington up Bathurst. The co-working space there was CSI which is the Center for Social Innovation on Bathurst, south of Bloor. We kept driving up Bathurst through, like, I guess it's Forest Hill. And then, did we take Bathurst the whole way? I feel like we took Bathurst probably the whole way to Eglinton, went west on Eglinton to the Allen. Does this make sense? And then up the Allen to Yorkdale, and then entered Yorkdale that way. Although, the I recall that the limo driver was you know, really looking at Waze, the traffic app, and there was a lot of zigzagging. So this route is approximate. Four Seasons, CBC, Yorkdale. That is the approximate route. Thank you so much for the letter. That's a fun fun one to just revisit. Um, by the way, that, that episode is our most listened to of all time on three books. Chapter 18 with David Sedaris. I think we're somewhere around 200,000 downloads on that show. So you know, you never know in this world or any world, like what's going to strike a nerve. But also, I'm not dumb enough to think it's necessarily struck a nerve. It's also the algorithm. Like, who knows what YouTube makes popular or what, you know, the Apple podcast app decides to feature. I, I can't control that stuff. So, as always, focus on inputs. Do I think it's the best interview? I can't even, li I can't honestly listen. I interrupted him a bunch. I was like putting my foot in my mouth, left, right, and center. So, you know, as always, it's a good sign of growth when you look back at your past self and you're like grimace. You know, I think I'm I'm at that place with that interview. It's 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 like where my TED talk is. It's like I can't really watch it anymore. I feel so bad about so many things. But anyway, I'm glad you liked it. All right. So we've done the review, we've done the letter, and now it's time for the word of the chapter. For the word of the chapter, we're gonna go back, of course, to Miss Susan Orlean. Portal of reality, devastation, essential and immediacy, mediated trophy, artifice, and authentic, voluble, beehive of conversation, craftsmanship, toggled, impressionistic, orderly, drive, humility, rattlesnake, wrangler, subculture, anthropology, tribes, dream job, documentarian, test driving, late motif, bingo. Oh, yeah, you know Susan Early was going to get the word cloud treatment. There's so many beautiful words that she used. She is just, uh, you know, she's got the uh, this incredibly massive and interesting and dynamic and specific vocabulary, which makes her a joy to listen to. Uh, as you may or may not know, on our FAQ on 3books.co, we make a list of every single chapter which features a word cloud. It's one of the questions at the bottom of the FAQ. So, Susan, you are worthy of the word cloud, but which word are we going to pick out? You know, the word that she used that I really didn't know what it meant, which is kind of the or origin of the word of the chapter. I was like, what does it mean? I don't know what the word means. Is volume. Voluble. Voluble. I mean, V-O-L-U-B-L-E, which according to Merriam-Webster's two definitions, although I think Susan used it in the form of the second. The first one means easily rolling or turning, like rotating, okay? That's a really voluble log rolling down the river. <laughs> I mean, just you wouldn't expect it. And then two, characterized by ready or rapid speech. Huh. Voluble's etymology goes back to the Latin word volvere, meaning to set in a circular course or to cause to roll. English rolled with that meaning, using voluble as an adjective to describe things easily rolling, changing, or turning, and later adding the meaning, which means read readily flowing speech. Readily flowing speech from things that easily turn. Kind of a metaphorical evolution, but a beautiful one. So today, voluble most often describes individuals who speak easily and Often, <sighs> lots of synonyms, of course. You know, loquacious means 
you know, there's garrulous, voluble, but uh, let's go with voluble. These kind of all, these kind of, you know, gar garrulous means prosy, rambling, or tedious loquacity. Loquaciousness, loquacious, loquacious, L-O-Q-U-A-C-I-O-S, suggests the power of expressing oneself articulately, fluently, or glibly. Lots of words, which makes sense because we're talking about the use of lots of words. We had a lot of words in this conversation with Susan Arlene. It was a joy. It was really, really fun to spend this time with you and with her sharing on a ton of things about exploring our curiosity, finding creativity where we can find it, talking about all these gems to help us as become better writers and more articulate kind of beings and the spiritual senses that we have inside us. I really, really love this conversation and I hope you did too. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, remember that you are what you eat and you are what you read. Keep turning that page, everybody. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care.